Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, September 20th, 2022 meeting of the Morro Bay Planning Commission. We will be without Bill Roshan tonight, but we do have a quorum and this meeting is called to order. We will start with a moment of silence. All right, thank you. Um, any planning commissioner announcements? We do have the Pledge of Allegiance <gasps> back on the agenda. We're back on the agenda. It, 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 it was missing pledge. because I kept forgetting to put it back on there, but All that is right, part of the bylaws and the, and the planning commission. We will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks for that, Scott. Uh, all right, planning commissioner announcements. Mike, anything? No, Asia, Joe? I have nothing. So let's move on to public comment. This time is for items which are not on the agenda or if you are not able to stay for something that is on the agenda later. I see Mr. Brannon, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Planning Commission. Barry Brannon, uh, citizen of Morro Bay. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you for all your effort as a Planning Commissioner. I try to read everything that you do, and I'm sure I don't see it all, but it, I really appreciate your efforts. It's uh, unsung heroes, I would say. Your recent accomplishment to me was when um, a project about some upzoning was done, done by Casa de Flores. And I think you did a, ma a magnificent job of analyzing the project and making your recommendation to the council. And for taking that firm stand, I want to thank you. In front of you, as you know, there's going to be major, really major issues facing us all. And um, obvious one is a Vista property that we have out here, that repurposing. The other one that's going to come that's kind of in the background, but it'll be facing you is the repurposing of the old sewer plant and how that's gonna be repurposed. I hope it comes to you properly. Here again, I hope it comes to you as a project rather than as somebody's, hey, what are we gonna do, point of view. Because I think that's the way a planning commission has to work. They have to consider the projects that come to them. Another project that is gonna come besides the Vista property or part of the Vista property is the battery storage project. Moss Landing, as you know, had a, a power generating facility by PG&E, just like Morro Bay. Similar plants, they kind of look the same if you drive by. This is a little closer to Highway 1 than ours is, but it's a, it's a very important facility. Now, Moss Landing plant is surrounded by farm fields. There's a marina right there, close, it's kind of small, but that was nice for bringing material in for the plant. But there are very few homes nearby. Now, Morro Bay, of course, is right next to, to our, I'm going to call it the number one cash cow for the city is the Embarcadero and the Rock. People come for miles. I met two German people today. They pulled off Highway 1. We're standing there with their tongues out, their cameras snapping the picture of Morro Rock. Morro Rock is important. However, as you may or may not know, I may have to take a little more time if I may. Um, the uh, battery storage facility that Vistra built at um, Moss Landing in September had a pretty good fire, September 2nd. And um, it fumed and they figured out how to shut it down. But today, there was another fire. PG&E also has a battery generating facility at Moss Landing right next door. And so today, today in the news, there was a shelter in place ordered for areas of Moss Landing and Highway 1 was closed due to the battery fire. May I read the news article if I can? A shelter in place has been ordered following a fire at the Tesla powered PG&E facility early Tuesday morning. The fire has also closed Highway 1 near Moss Landing causing traffic to take side roads. A shelter in place order was issued by North County Fire Department 
and the Monterey County Sheriff's Department offices for areas of Moss Landing west of Dolan Road and south of Struve Road and north of Potrero Road. The order was issued as crews determined if there's danger to the public from the hazardous materials. During the shelter in place, residents were being told to shut their windows and turn off their ventilation systems. The county created an incident information page showing the map of the shelter in place. The highway was closed between Jensen Road and Malero Road. Caltens reported it at 1.30 p.m. Eight, 10 hours later, they reported the road closure was extended and there was no estimate for time for reopening. There are two separate energy storages I mentioned earlier at Moss Landing. One is operated by Vistra. The other is operated by PG&E. The Vistra spokesman said that their equipment is safe, not burning this time, and it was not impacted by the fire. Their spokesman said they were aware of the fire at the PG&E battery facility, which is adjacent to their property. PG&E had a lengthy report, but in summary, the 182.5 megawatt energy storage facility went online in April of this year. It's not even six months. Mr. The system Brandon, includes. Can, can you, thank you wrap I'm it done. up? Thank you very thank much. You. Thank but you I want, so much. I want for this that into report. the record because I think it's very important. Yeah, it is important. Thank you so much. Anyone else for public comment? Hi, Barbara Dorr, um, resident. Just wanted to say I watched the, the workshop you had on the battery storage and on the reuse of um, the power plant. And I was really, I couldn't make it, but I was really nice to see all the wonderful ideas that came out of the various tables. And they were wonderful ideas to not have a battery storage in, in Morro Bay and endanger our lives, our children who are at the high school, and come up with the good things that the city's been talking about probably for a couple decades. And they really had a lot of good ideas. Thank you. And I'm really here for the um, general plan, item B1. Um, will you be taking testimony right away for that? Absolutely. Thank you. After the staff report. Right. Okay. Anybody else for general public comment? Hello. I usually don't do public speaking, so I'm going to read it, so I'm not, you know, off my game. Um, good evening. My name is Marie Katnese. Um I'm here to talk to you about the short-term vacation rentals. Uh, I strongly believe there needs to be some amendments to the ordinance because it's going to work effectively and be trusted by the residents. My first request is that you recommend to the city council that the position of code enforcer be part of the ordinance. Um, I have reasons for um, believing that this might be a good idea. I took the list of vacation rentals and I checked them all out. And to be real honest, um, 42 of 150 rentals in North Morrow Bay is posted, and exactly 90, 19 of 98 would, did so in South Morrow Bay. Um, it, one thing is, is for the neighbors of these vacation rentals, it's nice to know that it is rental. So if they see somebody there or, you know, that's, they don't think it's supposed to be there, they won't call the cops. Um, and if they, you know, or they, you know, excuse me. <laughs> um, like I said, um, it's a high percentage and the signs that were posted, um, there was a few that were um, in a second, st um, second story and because that was the only way they could be posted. You have a lot of long parking lots and log gates and fences. So I think that if you meant this and add the code enforcement to the ordinance, the code enforcer, uh, the position will always exist and not exist at the whim of the city council. Um, also, the code list needs to be in a usable form. Uh, it's pretty hard to distinguish. And the thing is, the ones that are posted, it's hard to know who are still vacation roles and who the people are who decide to stay a long time. And that's it, and I hope I didn't make a big fool of myself. Thank you very you much. You did great, thank you so much. Next up. Would you like the data? Yes, give me the 
Good evening. My name is Casey Cordes. Um, I've lived here in Morro Bay for six years, and I've had my eye on living here forever for about five and a half years. Um, it's not obviously this commission's job to <laughs> uh, navigate the waters of the housing prices or interest rates that are keeping me from being able to afford a home here, and that's not really what I'm here to talk about. But I would like to uh, talk about something that I saw on the um, uh, Department of California Department of Finance's website, which is that one in five houses in Morro Bay, or I should say one in five properties in Morro Bay is vacant at this time. Um, that has gone up over the years. Um, I think that's a number that should really alarm us for a lot of reasons, not because we don't know why they're vacant. Obviously, it could be uh, speculative investment. It could be uh, full-time vacation homes for people who live out of town. I, I don't think there's, you know, um, a moral problem with either of those. But I think we should consider that as the residents of this town, um, we have a say in the future of the way that the incentives work to our housing, to having neighbors, to having more kids in our schools, to having more Monday to Friday traffic in our businesses. I think that those are all really, really powerful reasons to want people to be in the homes that are in our very small town. And I think that that should be something that all of the uh, commissions in our city are aware of and thinking of. So um, one in five may not sound like the end of the world today, but um, I'm thinking about Morro Bay for 10 years or 20 years or 40 years, because like I said, this is my forever home. And so I think, you know, where is the number that would be alarming? Would it be, uh, you know, 40% of homes vacant? Would it be 50%? To me, 20% is alarming. Um, and yeah, I wanted to bring that to our attention. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. Next up for public comment, Ms. Winholtz. Good evening, Betty Winholtz. Um, I would like to say that I noticed in the paper that Estero Bay News that the city was able to put in a big ad about getting a grant. And so I would like for the city to put in a big ad to advertise the zoning ordinance going before the council because this ad didn't go in the paper when the zoning ordinance came to you. But if we have the money to do this for an announcement of a good thing, we also should be able to announce to the public that they are invited to be involved into the zoning ordinance evaluation and, and moving forward. So whatever you do tonight, I hope you would encourage the council to, to do that. Um, I'd like to say that I read through the comments online and um, I support a lot of what those people said, um, uh, particularly Mr. Green questioning about the hotels and our housing uh, residential areas and you've talked about that. Um, I'll make some more comments later when we come to that, but um, I just want to reinforce um, that I'm real excited that we've had a lot of good comments. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience wishing to speak at this time? Anthony, do we have anybody online or on the phone? Thank you, Chair. We have no raised hands in the queue. All right, we will close public comment and bring it back to the commission. Uh, any comments, questions? Um, I was just gonna ask, mm -hmm. um, just this gets back to process again, and I think we've developed a good process, and I hope we've set ourselves up for being able to approve what we've done during the last three meetings, but so I hope Cindy's ready to march through our top 10, and because one of the things we had suggested is that we vote, remember, on certain things that were coming up, but we were gonna wait for those. Now Commissioner Roshan is in here, but he had a lot to do with that. So it kind of excites me a little bit, but I think we can still do what we need to do tonight if we've got our ducks lined up, because we can still take a vote. We have a quorum here, so I just wanted to note that, that you took outstanding minutes for us, so I'm sure we can get through this if we follow the process we kind of set up at the beginning. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, 
question uh, about the short-term vacation rentals. Um, I, I know it's in the staff report that we have a second code enforcement, part-time code enforcement officer. Um, just came on board a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago. Um, so he's, uh, he's a full-time employee, but he's um, part code enforcement officer, gotcha. um, part building inspector. Um, so we're getting him up to speed now. We have uh, an existing code enforcement officer that works part-time about 15 hours a week. Um, we do charge and we have fees associated with the, the, um, the licensing of our vacation rentals that pay for that position. Um, and it's just now that we're, we're implementing that and moving that forward so we're able to actually implement the short-term rental program that's in the ordinance that we adopted over a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, it just it took staff resources and we didn't have them. Um, right. So it's one thing to adopt the program, but if you don't have folks to implement the program, then mm -hmm. the program is sort of Challenge. ineffectual. Um, but we do monitor vacation rentals anyway. I mean, it's not like it's something we don't monitor. Um, we do, and we monitor the ones that are licensed and unlicensed, and we go after those. Um, it's pretty common, and we have an application that we use, host compliance, that helps us with that. Um, so that's the process, and we'll be rolling that out and going through and creating an inspection program that's required of mm -hmm. the ordinance and you know, visiting all of the vacation rental sites. Um, we're doing that in conjunction with our fire department. They also have a mandate to um, visit uh, visitors serving accommodations in the city, not just hotel rooms, but also short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. And so we're working that out with them. and coming up with a checklist and what we're going to be you know, requiring of everyone and then letting everybody know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, some people know that we have the new ordinance and some people don't. Um, and so we're going to be introducing all of the, the licensed uh, vacation rental folks to that, as well as the ones that are on our wait list. And we have a significant wait list that has probably, I mean, once we clear some of them out, there'll probably be about 160 to 180 folks. Wow. Um, so. um, is, can I ask sure. a question? Um, and right now, I know that vacation rentals have to post the permit sign on somewhere in their front mm. entry or front of the house. Does that um, apply to if there are fences or second story or is there adjustment for? It's a good question. For that? Um, has to be visible from the right of way. Um, we're actually internally probably going to be putting together a spec for the sign, mm -hmm. so they're all the same. That's a great idea. Same yeah. color. We we do that for our notice signs, the big yellow ones mm -hmm. that get posted mm -hmm. on a site. They're all you know they're all the same color, so everybody knows like oh that's a sign for a project. We're going to do something like that for them, and we're going to require everybody to move to that sign um, type. Um, and then we're probably going to work with the with the, at least one of the signed folks in town, uh, you know, about like maintaining that that spec um, specification um, for that type of sign, so people can just go there and get it. Um, so that's, the, that's a concept internally um, to address that issue. We also do that for um, folks that uh, say have a building permit that's active. They have an orange card that gets placed on their property. So similar idea, maybe we'll go with green, something like that. <laughs> there I don't you know. go. Yeah. And is there a public um, website beyond the private market sites um, where residents can see what homes have those permits? Also a good question. Um, we do have an active list. Um, we're working our way through it right now. We've, we've moved to a third party um, uh, company that issues our business licenses in town and they also do the licensing for the vacation rentals and that was recent and we're sort of working out the kinks with that. Um, we do have a kind of a beta map of um, all of the registered vacation rentals. Um, even ones that we have on the, on the, um, on the wait list are also noted in it. Um, so working with our GIS person I was actually talking to him today about it um, to make some fixes to it. So that's something we'll be publishing. Um, and the ordinance um, um, requires us to have the, the list of, um, of licensed vacation rentals posted. Um, that's one of the things we went through a big renewal uh, back in June and July. And um, so uh, we're waiting to see how all that shakes out through the process uh, to see who we have left over to see if we've brought down the number from 250 licensed um, short-term rentals to the 175 that's allowed in the ordinance or how close we are. Because once we get down to the 175 or below that, we can start pulling people off the list. So um, again, all this is in process and happening kind of real time. Right yeah. Now. So. Can I ask a question, Susan? Sure. So based upon that and public comment, Scott, so we have, this is, this is the thing I heard, we have a new ordinance, right? So are we playing catch up because we didn't have staff resources and are we gonna start doing things that we haven't done in the past? So in other words, are we, are we doing both? We're playing catch up and then we're gonna start doing things we haven't done in the past. It, it, I would say, you know, we, we adopted the ordinance a little over a year ago. Um, we didn't have the staff um, 
folks in place to implement everything that was in it. Okay. Um, we've monitored vacation rentals um, prior to the adoption of the ordinance. Um, and so that was a, a thing that code enforcement was taking care of. Um, now there, there are many things that are required of the city um, from a monitoring standpoint and the vacation rental from an operation, from the vacation rental operator owner from an operational standpoint that it required to do. And so now we're all moving on to that piece. And okay. uh, be, with the new staff, um, person, we're, we're able to start that process. So it's exciting and good for folks out in the community to know that we'll be having a more active, um, you know, response to our vacation rental folks and be more actively managing them, um, which we just didn't have the capability to do to this point until we hired the new person. So great. Sounds good. Yep. And, and, they, and they're paying for it. What, like the, the, right. They're paying for yeah. that component right. of it uh, is being paid for by the by the vacation rental folks. So the people are licensed. And, and I will let the member of the audience know um, one of the things when we were working on the ordinance that was really important was that <laughs> signage and that it be out at the street, you know, facing side because a lot of the signs are very small and in the window and you wouldn't necessarily walk up to that house that feels like a private house to find out who you call when there's a, a problem. So we did have that discussion that there needed to be consistent and appropriate signage, who to contact in an emergency, and that it was a vacation rental. So, all right. I think we can move along to the consent calendar. Um, all we have is A1, the current and advanced planning processing list. Do I have a motion to move. receive and file? <laughs> yeah, move to receive and file and approve. I'll second that. On the consent calendar, we could do public mm -hmm. comment. <laughs> Almost mm -hmm. nobody ever has a comment, but Sorry. let's just say today we do. Thanks, mm -hmm. Barbara. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really nice being here and seeing you all. I do watch your meetings, Barbara Dore. Um, I'm a member of KQED um, Public Television, mm. and they sent out newsletters in Oakland, and it's having serious problems with um, the hazardous materials. It's a super site, and it's with the seawater rise, it's bringing up a lot of these problems. And I've gotten two in the last week, I think, that discussed it. And I think what came up on the discussion of the battery storage, and I know that's, I've looked through your list of uh, items, so I know that's on there, the battery storage. A lot of people wanted a cleanup, no matter what the use was in the future that we're at your meeting. And my thought is, if, if water rise, and with climate change is going to impact the hazardous materials that are buried in the ground, it's really critical that we clean them up. Um, so I don't know where that goes in the system, but I would suggest you check out Oakland and see the problems they're having. Thanks so much for that. Any, anyone else for public comment on the consent agenda? Anthony, anybody in the airwaves there? Thank you, Chair. We have no raised hands in the queue. All right. Thank you. We'll close public comment, and we have a motion on the floor. Can we just do an all in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Any Aye. opposed? All right. Let's move along to our public hearing, and we'll continue with Ms. Jacinth. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Just getting situated here. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission and um, folks of the audience and at home. This is a continued public hearing item for the uh, zoning code, coastal implementation plan, uh, update project portion of Plan Morrow Bay. And uh, I will be giving uh, the presentation continuing from our continued hearing from September 6th and the prior hearing from August 16th. And so, uh, per the commission's um, input, uh, I did continue the presentation so that it it, it restates um, some of the um, commentary that we had from the previous meeting. And so here is just uh, an agenda format of what the presentation looks like. And so it is documenting where we landed on the commission's review of the top ch top ten changes to the zoning code update. Uh, discussion of the public input and planning commissioner comments received, 
um, and then concluding the presentation um, with the staff recommendation uh, that the Planning Commission forward a favorable recommendation to the City Council for um, adoption of the zoning code uh, slash implementation plan. And then um, just going through, um, these are the same slides as what you saw previously. Uh, these top 10 changes as identified by staff. Um, items one and two, coastal resources and development standards. Planning Commission looked at this on August 16th uh, and made no changes to these two chapters. Uh, with regard to item number three and commercial heights in the downtown area, uh, Planning Commission did review that and uh, you'll see in the second bullet uh, capturing what uh, that action was or not official action, but what your recommendation was uh, to staff, which was that uh, the Planning Commission did not favor that proposal. Uh, we would remove that allowance um, in the adoption uh, version that goes to the City Council. Uh, number four, uh, fence heights and accessory structures. And um, as you recall, we did receive a lot of public comment on this. Uh, the direction from fences um, changed at the September 6th meeting, as noted in the second bullet. Um, we've updated it for Planning Commission, and that was that the direction to staff uh, was that in reviewing the uh, fence heights in the front yard areas, uh, that Planning Commission's direction was is that they did support an, in an increased front yard fence height of one extra foot um, going uh, four feet solid or five feet if 50% open to the passage of light and air. Uh, in um, what we refer to as North Morro Bay, but technically it's northeast, so this would be that area of town north of Alva Paul Creek and east of Highway 1, just to be specific for the record, um, where lots are generally smaller uh, with minimal to no backyard options. And then accessory structures, um, no change was uh, given to staff at the September 6th meeting, um, but this bullet does show uh, what that direction was um, at the August 16th meeting. And, um, and staff would make that corresponding um, um, correction. And then uh, top 10 changes uh, for five, six, and seven, uh, non-conforming chapter regulations, parking regulations and signs, uh, no changes uh, were recommended uh, to these chapters. And then uh, design review. So. At the September 6th meeting is where we picked up on the top 10 and we had um, some detailed discussion on items 8, 9, and 10. And um, so you'll see here uh, at the last bullet, uh, planning, dis after discussing this uh, chapter, it actually consists of two chapters, planning commission accepted and no changes were made. Number nine was housing. This is um, chapter 1724. Uh, the direction to staff uh, by Planning Commission at the last meeting was to modify the in -lieu, housing in-lieu fee regulations to allow expenditure of in-lieu fees for projects uh, that may be located outside of the city limits if it benefits residents. So looking at what makes the, the most good uh, with the goal of providing, um, oh, I just said this, flexibility to use in-lieu fees where most sensible and that um, Planning Commission's direction was that language um, should be added that projects physically located within the city limits would be prioritized, and no other changes were made to this chapter. And then uh, the last uh, top 10 change item uh, spoke of the state law updates as it related to accessory dwelling units, density bonus provisions, and Senate Bill 9 provisions, um, also known as urban lot splits. Uh, Planning Commission reviewed these three areas uh, and made no recommendations to staff for changes. Uh, this takes me to uh, the second half of the presentation I didn't get to last time, so a lot of these slides were um, just restated in um, your staff report. Uh, they look similar from the last um, Planning Commission staff report. Um, and bef um, before I get into the, the comments we received from the Planning Commissioners, I did want to point out this is discussed in the staff report. Um, we did receive quite a bit, uh, quite a large amount of public comment. And um, similar to what we did for the Plan War of A, the general plan update, is uh, we prepared a cataloged summary in a spreadsheet format um, that went through and really, you know, in an effort to be responsive to the citizen um, resident public comment that we re received and also to be, you know, transparent about like how we were receiving public comment and addressing it, if there were changes made, if we couldn't make 
changes or recommend changes because perhaps maybe it conflicted with direction we got from Planning Commission, GPAC, City Council, Coastal Commission. So that exhibit B in your staff report is that spreadsheet. And for um, over the last, you know, this being the third adoption hearing over the last, you know, the last three adoption hearings, we've um, updated that and to provide as much clarity as possible. Um, at the last meeting, Vice uh, Chairperson Roshan uh, did, you know, bring up some uh, comment and we, um, as discussed in the staff report, uh, tried to really kind of make sure that that was a uh, complete response in that spreadsheet. So um, that's not included in the, in the PowerPoint presentation because there's over 170 rows in the spreadsheet, uh, but that's where you would find th that commentary or that staff re response. And then uh, we have some slides um, detailing uh, the comments and the correspondence we received from the Planning Commission. Uh, we re I'm going to start with Chairperson S uh, Susan Stewart uh, submitted a letter uh, uh, discussing uh, various components um, that she uh, wanted to weigh in on. And there are five bullets here. The first one was with regard to design review, really kind of clarifying uh, what that language is in the design review chapter, um, and, and that was one of the top 10 that the staff had also uh, pointed out, that's chapter 1738. 38. And so what you see in the blue, uh, blue font on the screen here is some recommended um, language edits that we got from um, Mr. Uh, John, Man John Mandeville, excuse me, uh, who was one of the public comment commenters and uh, suggested that in order to better implement our general plan uh, vision for community character areas, uh, that really the uh, paragraph, subparagraphs A and G should be modified uh, to um, point you back to that general plan vision for community character areas. Um, and staff um, you know, looked at this after receiving the comment from uh, Chairperson Stewart um, and um, agrees that this um, is a good recommendation. Um, should the Planning Commission um, direct staff to make this edit as well. Uh, the next bullet was regarding um, a request to address public comment regarding permitted uses in the uh, residential, the high residential, high density residential zone, which is what we currently know as R4, um, and whether multifamily housing zones should allow short-term rentals. Um, the, uh, staff review of this is that, um, and we discussed this at the previous meeting, um, that our high density housing um, zoning district, R4, and, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, it's intended to be a transitional zone to really, you know, in our current R4 zone, it allows for uh, high density uh, residential, also allows for some hotel professional offices. Um, and those are uses that are only allowed with a conditional use permit. And, and the idea being, as, as it says in the um, purpose statement in the beginning of the zone district, is to make sure that it doesn't um, impact um, neighboring high density, you know, family living, you know, those other uses there, that there's not excessive congestion and noise and other disturbances by having, you know, these mix of uses. Um, the current STR ordinance, um, staff would note, allows 12.5% of multifamily units to be used as short-term uh, rentals um, for developments of eight units or more. Um, so um, Planning Commission uh, should review and make uh, recommendation um, if there is a desire for potential uses, uh, use changes to the ordinance. And then the next bullet uh, was a request to clarify public comment received regarding farm worker housing. Uh, we the, you know, the format of the zoning code, it was, you know, it's a comprehensive update, and so um, um, the language is written a little bit differently, but farm worker housing uses are included um, elsewhere in the zoning code, and that would, you would find that in the land use regulations and development standards section. Um, and then last, uh, address public comment received regarding the city's role in economic development. Um, uh, the city has an adopted economic development element that is in our general plan uh, LCP. Uh, we have an economic development strategic plan, um, and as described in the staff report, um, it's also part of um, enshrined in, in state law regarding planning and zoning law. So that um, is, is definitely, the city does have a role in, in economic development. Uh, we also received a letter from Commissioner um, Ingrafia, and just to go through uh, those responses, um, 
the first comment was, um, and some of these have already been addressed because we've you know, worked through these in the last um, uh, hearing, um, disagrees with the proposed 37-foot um, height in the downtown area, and the direction uh, to staff was to remove this. Uh, accessory structures should not be allowed inside rear side and rear setbacks on lots less than 3,500 square feet. Um, and what staff heard at the August 16th meeting was that um, accessory structures um, would be okay to have a reduced building setback, uh, but they should not be in the side yard. So they could be up against the house if it's behind the house um, and, out, and not along the side of the house. And uh, number three, um, disagrees with the proposed fence uh, height increase. Uh, this I, I updated, I added here in bold font uh, what the direction was uh, from the Planning Commission at the last meeting. Um, and certainly if there's um, a desire to continue discussing this, but the recommendation was to allow for the one foot height increase. And then, um, as I said earlier, the housing in lieu fees. Um, and so um, after discussion um, on this last at this, on this topic, at the last meeting, uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation was to uh, modify those in-lieu fee regulations, um, as I previously mentioned. And then there were three more uh, uh, bulleted items from Commissioner Ingrafia. That includes um, support for recommending a ban of new installation of spray irrigation in commercial and residential areas. Um, the Proposed zoning code includes chapter 1725 uh, that does require um, compliance with the state's uh, water efficient landscape ordinance. That's the acronym for uh, WELO. Uh, we uh, frequently find that people that go above and beyond what that requirement is, um, uh, we are seeing a lot of you know, very, very low water use um, inst uh, irrigation. Uh, but, but nevertheless, they are, that is, um, in the draft zoning code in 1725. Uh, recommends enforcement of short-term vacation rental ordinance, and of course, your letter was much longer, Commissioner Ingrafia, I've, I've, I've greatly summarized this. Uh, code enforcement uh, does address this, and as Scott uh, mentioned earlier, the city has hired a second code enforcement officer to assist with this. And then prevent conversion of multifamily housing to unhosted hotels or um, STRs, and um, I, uh, pick this up with the earlier slide in that um, our current ordinance does allow for a percentage of multifamily units uh, to be used um, as short-term rentals uh, when there are developments of eight units or more. Um, so should the Planning Commission uh, desire changes, um, then um, that should be part of your review and recommendation uh, to, to staff. And, and that's only in commercial or mixed-use zones. Multifamily housing in other zones, you know, standard multifamily housing districts, STVRs are not allowed in those areas. Yeah, I think I'm, I might have been a little misunderstood. I, I wasn't objecting to that portion of mm -hmm. units within an apartment building being allowed to be turned into short-term vacation rentals. That I, that I understand, and, okay. that, and that approach seems limited and conservative. What I was getting at was apartment buildings being sold and turned into unhosted hotels, okay, Mm -hmm. And that has the same effect as if the entire apartment building were turned into short-term vacation rentals. And so I was hoping that we would um, that. not allow apartment buildings, it, grandfathered, the ones that are already in existence, of course, but we would try to do something to limit the conversion of existing apartment buildings into unhosted hotels for fear that it would subvert what the intent is of the short-term vacation rentals. That's, that's what I was really getting okay. at. Okay. okay, thank you. Can I ask a question, Joe? With Commissioner Ingrafia? Because this falls under housing, I believe, right? It, it was under discussion of housing. Now, I thought we had discussed the first opportunity should be to develop more housing. In other words, instead of doing the conversions, we should try to build more housing in Morro Bay. I thought that was part of our discussion, that we were trying to look for more housing opportunities. So sure. we should not do this uh, first. We should consider more housing. And, uh, it's coming back to me. I'm just, I just thought that was part of the large discussion we had, you know, that our priority should be housing, not more conversions. 
Right. Yeah. I, I, Is that about right? I mean, yeah, these two things are not, you know, mutually. Did, I just wanted to bring that up because I think one of our goals should be to create more housing opportunities in Morro Bay. Not because the law is just saying it, right? I mean, this is law now, but we should be trying to pursue goals like that since we do have a requirement to develop more housing, including affordable housing, if possible. That's why we discussed that, but more in the in lieu fees, right? Yeah. So it got pretty complicated is what I'm saying. It's not an easy discussion. That's why I was hoping we could follow the last format because we're we're kind of going all over the place now. We're going from our original top 10 to subcategories of discussions from planning commissioners like Commissioner Ingrafia. So I just want to keep it as easy as possible for us. I'd like to respond to that comment. Sure, um, sure. So what we're doing this evening um, was specifically directed by the planning commission. Um, this was in your last packet from the last planning commission meeting. Um, and um, you may recall that we continued from the first meeting when we went over the, the top 10, and one of the requests from the Planning Commission was that the commission come up with their list of things because that list came from staff. These are the things we viewed as the top 10 items, top 10 changes in the code. But the commission at that original meeting uh, back in August um, discussed that you would come up with your own commentary um, related to that and have your maybe top 10 list, each of you or, or whatnot. We received comments from uh, Commissioner Stewart and Commissioner Ingrafia, and that's what you're looking at right now. We're going over the comments that were received. Many of these were covered previously. They, they raised points that were covered at the last Planning Commission meeting on this subject, but that's what we're doing. Um, once we're done with this, the Planning Commission is free to go back into any of these things yeah. and talk about them. Yeah. So. And that's the point I was trying to make, Scott, is the fact that we're going to be marching through the 10. I've already checked off the ones that we're good to go with, but I still have motions to be made on three, four, eight, nine, and I'm waiting to do that as a planning commission, make motions that the planning commission would approve as a commission, take a vote on, and getting to what we were just talking about, about possibly looking for more housing opportunities versus making more conversions. So I get what you're saying, Scott. It's just that during the last three meetings, we've had a lot of, we've been kind of had sub discussions. I didn't submit a list because I felt we were doing that in public. We were having our discussions in public, but some commissioners did, so I didn't. So. And that's the commentary that would come as part of Cindy's presentation because she's not done yet, but it, you're free to make any comments you, you want related to this. It's not, it doesn't have to follow the format. That was just what was discussed at the meeting and we were being respectful of the process that was directed by the planning commission. We wanted to give you what you asked for. Um, and that's what we did, but we fully expect the other commissioners who didn't provide written comments to have ideas about things we're talking about. That's, that's part of the, the debate here, so. Yeah, yeah. okay. I agree. So I'd, I'd like to have Cindy finish the staff report yep. and okay. then. Um, All right. We can have questions of staff, and then we will open for public comment. But let's get through the staff report. Okay, thank well, you. Well, thanks. Well, you might like my next slide. So, um, I think in the staff report, this was the last slide before the recommendation. But um, we did, you know, commissions talking about housing and supporting more housing, and we did get, you know, as you saw through the presentation, there was a lot of talk about like, is it appropriate to have hotels in the RH zone, what we, what we know today as R4 zone, the high-density mm -hmm. residential. So um, we put together just a really quick slide. Um, this is um, kind of general, but just as, as a way to have that conversation. So we did get, you know, public correspondence that was posted this morning um, regarding, again, you know, this was from Mr. Sean Green, regarding whether or not um, hotels and motels should be allowed in the RH district. It, I, I just, this is kind of my paraphrasing here. Um, but whether or not, so in the proposed RH zone, they're allowed, they would be allowed as a conditionally permitted use, which means you need a CUP. Um, and is that appropriate when we should be allowing more housing and that this is a goal of, mm -hmm. of the Planning Commission, the City Council to have um, more housing in, in these zone districts? Um, and I just wanted to, you know, have the conversation, give some con contextualize this for the commission, so that you can use this information uh, to inform your um, deliberation. Um, and so I uh, went back and I looked at the definition, you know, because zoning has to be consistent with the the, the land use map, um, mm -hmm. and it implements that from the general plan. From mm -hmm. from the general plan, 
um, in the high density residential land use category, it, um, it's very general um, and it discusses that um, high density residential should be for multifamily housing uses um, and uh, describes, you know, the types of multifamily housing. Um, there are situations where you can do single family housing only if the lot size would otherwise preclude it because maybe it's like a 2,400 square foot lot. Um, then I looked at the purpose statement of the zoning district. Um, and in our current zone, which is R4, it is a residential hotel professional office zone district. And it specifically says multifamily housing, you know, single unit, multi-unit development, hotels, professional offices are allowed. Those commercial uses are allowed when, um, um, it's, when it's appropriate in, in, the, in the neighborhood. Um, so it, the intent in drafting up the zoning code was that it allow hotels um, in this you know, transitional area. Um, but what happened when we updated the zoning map is we added some uh, new zone classifications. So in the current zoning uh, map, we have along North Moore Bay, we have the MCR R4 zone, and that's a mix of commercial residential. It's the R4. It allows hotels, allows Mix, it allows both residential and commercial. We split that up, and we so we did a few different things. Uh, and then we got rid of the North Main specific plan, and that you'll see is neighborhood commercial zones um, along that North Main strip. And then the TMU is a transitional mixed use zone district um, that is where um, just uh, south of the downtown area, um, I think one or two blocks south of Main Street. Um, and so those are areas where we're describing the various like transitional zones, mix of residential and commercial. Uh, the intent was that in the RH, it would still allow for hotel and commercial uses. Ho yeah, hotel, hotel uses, sorry, hotel and motel uses. Um, certainly though, the way that it's drafted, it's not clear in the mission statement. And so should the plan, if the planning commission were to choose to remove hotels and motels as a conditionally permitted use. Um, it could certainly do that and it wouldn't create any impacts with the general plan uh, land use map because it doesn't describe high density residential as something that is defined as including commercial uses. Um, zoning tends to be a little bit more specific. In our current zoning code, it does say residential, hotel, professional offices. The way that the zoning code was drafted, um, that's before you tonight, it doesn't have that extra sentence in there that says, in the RH zone district, you can do multifamily housing and hotels, motels, if conditionally permitted. So there's two choices before you, um, and, and not, you can discuss it. You can, you can remove the, the conditionally permitted use, the hotel, motel, or um, should, you, should you decide that, you know, we do have these other uh, zone classifications and you're okay with keeping hotels, then your recommendation should include uh, to the city council that that purpose statement be clarified um, so that it's consistent um, with how we treat the R4 zone currently. Um, and that's what I'm kind of describing here in the third bullet. Um, and um, I would, one other thing I would point out too is that in the neighborhood commercial and in the TMU, those two zone districts, <laughs> hotels and motels are permitted uses. And by that I mean it doesn't require a conditional use permit. It may require a coastal development permit. It doesn't require a conditional use permit because that conditional use permit is that vehicle, that tool that planning commissions have uh, to make sure that there's not um, uh, impacts um, uh, health, safety, general welfare, it's those standard findings. It's making sure that there's not excessive traffic, congestion, noise, odor impacts. Um, hotels and motels in the RH zone uh, would be conditionally permitted. So you would have that mechanism to kind of control, is it appropriate? Um, but it's intended to be a complementary use. So it's not to say that you can't do residential, multifamily, but it's complementary. And how are we balancing out um, the complementary uses that are in the in the overall RH zone. So that that's it, and probably more information than you wanted to know. <laughs> I would. Mm. There was there was there's a lot to unpack there, and mm. I know that probably sounds kind of complicated. Um, probably 
the way I can condense it best is to say the R4 in every instance in the current code is in a location that is transitional between residential and commercial areas, so you see a mix of uses there. And that's why the current zoning code allows you to have residential, office professional, hotel motel, because those are the things that you find in the transitional areas. When we went to the new code, we decided to be a little more nuanced. And we broke that R4, uh, that R4 area up into, into different um, neighborhood commercial as one. That's the area kind of along Main Street that Cindy described. Transitional mixed use, that's that one or two blocks south of uh, Morbay Boulevard. Um, and then residential high density. So in the NCTMU, like Cindy said, hotel, motel is a principally permitted use. And then in the RH, conditionally permitted use. So that's kind of the difference. But the idea there was to break them up into their individual pieces where it made sense to do so. Um, and to really re emphasize the fact that those, are, those areas are all sort of transitional type areas. So I think that's the best way that you could probably take away from that. Uh, I don't know if that was helpful or not, but I thought I'd try. And then with that, I will just go to the next slide because, you know, um, and that leads us to, um, that concludes my presentation. It leads us to the um, zoning code implementation plan adoption. You have before you uh, planning commission resolution 0822. Um, if there are uh, recommendations um, that were not covered in the uh, presentation that you'd like to um, add, we would like uh, the Planning Commission to review and discuss, uh, discuss um, and then add any uh, clarifications, refinements, recommendations that you would add to the uh, resolution, um, making your um, favorable recommendation to City Council for adoption of the Zoning Code um, Coastal Implementation Plan, which is Title 17 of Armorial Bay Municipal Code, uh, with a finding that no further environmental review was required pursuant to State Secret Guidelines Section 15162. And um, that's my presentation, so thank you. Thank you for that. All right, back to commission questions for staff. Okay, Asia. Okay, mm -hmm. Mike, questions for staff? No. All right, let's open for public comment then. You have three minutes to speak on this item. Ms. Dorr. Yes. I made copy, copies of the documents that I'm referencing for you all. Okay, Barbara Dorr, um, I came here tonight for one reason only, and that's to support keeping the existing affordable housing that we do have. And specifically, I am here to oppose the proposed land use change for the southeast corner of Quintana and South Bay Boulevard. That's where the Sea Pines RV Park is, right off the Highway 1, and up in the bluff. There are 54 double-wide um, modular housing units, very nicely done. Um, it's affordable housing, but that's being changed from residential or has been changed from residential to visitors serving commercial. On about page 47, figure LU4, uh, it's in your document. The current res residential use at this site now has at least 54 double wide modular homes and an RV park 54 lovely, affordable housing units. Every candidate, every council member, every mayor, anybody running for assembly, they want affordable housing, and the planning commission does too, and you're gonna take those 54 units and dump them and bring in visitors serving commercial. I'm sorry, I'll keep it sweet. <laughs> As I stated, in 2018, the existing modular housing is very nice, and important to keep for moderate income housing. The portion at the corner is an RV park with a six month stay limit as I understand it. The city will lose valuable permanent housing units if this is changed to visitor serving commercial. 
The existing RV park appears to be used by visitors coming to the community, tourists, and temporary workforce housing. Both uses are very important to Morro Bay. And I just wonder how the Planning Commission and the city can justify eliminating affordable housing. We go out and support higher densities, multiple variances to get an apartment complex, but let's keep what we have. Our city has enough visitors serving commercial. As I said, I am here tonight for one reason only, to try and protect affordable housing. And I'm asking you to please join me in doing something um, on this proposed land use change from residential to visitor serving commercial. Please support affordable housing in Morro Bay. Now it's not my written comments, but after listening, every sing everything you do affects affordable housing in this community. And I would suggest you have an absolute limit on short-term vacation rentals. Nobody can even tell how many can be used. Every different zone that may have different exceptions, different uses. Every time you give a short-term vacation rental to someone, you're taking away from a good family, maybe with kids or older folks that want to live in this community. So please, when you do go back and when you do talk about affordable housing, look at what the short-term vacation rentals are doing to this community. And I think it's city greed. There's personal greed, but it's also city greed that's running this, the transient occupancy tax and getting more revenues. We may need them, but don't destroy our community in the process. Thank you so Thank much. You. I'll watch you from home, and I do appreciate everything you guys do, and I Thank do watch. You. I can't get out as much, but I wasn't going to miss being here tonight. Please look at my 2018 memo, because it also has a number of items which I'm sure have not been addressed and fixed. Thank, Thank you. Glad you came. Next up for public comment, Ms. Winholtz. Amen to Ms. Uh, Doris' comments. Um, I made a similar comment um, in written to you. Uh, I just assumed it was an error that you had changed the zoning, but maybe it was intentional. And so I would highly encourage you to keep it as it is, or as it should be, as uh, Blue Heron is. Um, regarding um, uh, hotels, I encourage you to take those out of R4 or whatever the new letters are for that district. Um, I agree that um, that's kind of what happened with this uh, uh, new unhosted hotel thing, was in an R4 zone, could have been real housing, and now it's a hotel. So as much as we can get rid of hotels, we have a zillion hotels, we have a zillion um, STRs, I think we don't need those in our residential area, and I hope that you will uh, vote to change that tonight. Um, um, what else? Um, I would like to know, um, with regarding the fences, I, I did not remember that you had approved increasing uh, fences in uh, the islands, the island streets, um, at, up one foot. I thought it was to stay the same, and if people wanted it changed, they would ask for a modification. So I'm just going to say that my memory or observation was different, and it could be wrong. I, I honor that that may be true. But I'd like to ask, uh, what's the difference between asking for a modification versus asking for a variance? And what the different implications would be if we had people who wanted higher fences to come back with a, a difference between asking for a modification or a variance. Um, I, I want to say uh, thank you to Ms. Uh, Cassinetti for um, her survey um, that we know that the postings aren't happening, 20% in one area, 30% only in the other half of the town. Um, that's not good. Um, I think this is why we need a code enforcement permanently. I think that um, not this council, their next council, any council can at their whim get rid of a code enforcer and has in the past and then hired them back and like that. But I think this position needs to be in the code so it never goes away. If we're gonna be so hot on vacation rentals that we need to have that as a permanent position. And the whole idea that this posting thing, the language, you need to look at that in the ordinance because I don't think it's adequate. It doesn't account for the gates, the block fences, you know, no place to post. And so I think you're gonna need to look at that language and fix that. 
um, STRs. I, I want to know uh, the new wires that have been going up in South Moore Bay. I don't know if they're in North. I assume they fit under 17.30.250, and I, I'd like to hear about that a little bit. And I would like for you to make a decision about parking. Um, are you actually going to eliminate uh, parking in Luffy's on the Embarcadero or make them require it? Are you, how, how are you going to do that? Um, and then just real quickly at the end, uh, special events, which is 17.30-260, uh, um, talks about special events. You know, there's been some concern with the residents about the event that happened over the Margarita Festival out at The Rock. Um, how does that fit into this? Um, do we need to have tighter reg re requirements so that kind of event doesn't happen again? Thanks, Betty. Next up for public comment. Welcome back. Hi, Casey Cordes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to briefly say, uh, speak in support of this great tool that I think um, the city has given you. Uh, you know, by splitting up these, uh, this one zoning ordinance into four, they've basically said, you know, here's a scalpel where you can take a look at the city and be very particular. I think it's very important that you not openly allow uh, just you know, the building of new hotels or motels in the in the existing R four or R F R H R H zoning. I think it's very important that you limit that only to residential. And obviously, you have the tool to allow one off exemptions if that's in the best public interest. But as far as the floodgates go, let's you know, let's let's narrow those down a little bit. We have a lot of uh, you know. Um, uh, you know, commercial that is available for um, hotels and motels. We have a lot of hotels and motels, and if we want to, um, you know, provide, bring in a higher quality of, um, or higher, like, caliber of visitor, we can renovate some of those. We can uh, tear them down and rebuild them, but we don't need to use some of that precious um, uh, residential zoning for that. So thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody else for public comment in the audience? Anthony, do we have anybody in the queue? Thank you, Chair. We have no raised hands in the queue. All right, I will close public comment, then bring it back to the commission. Um, let's see. Susan, yes. can I make a request? Can we sure. take like a five minute break before we get on to this? Okay, we'll, we'll have a stretch of the legs for five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, we are back from our little break. Um, I would like to ask staff specifically about um, the change in the RV park. Um, there was no change. Okay. It's, it's the same in the existing code as it is in the proposed. We didn't change anything. Okay. Much. And um, is that partly because there is the part of that park that is more of a visitor commercial come and go RV park? Yeah, the front portion of Bay Pines is an, is an RV park. Right. And it's behind that where you get into the mobile home units. And, and do we have any protections for those kinds of housing properties? So we were, Cindy and I were just looking in the, um, the zoning code and the use tables. Mm -hmm. And I uh, don't see mobile home underneath the visitor, uh, mobile home parks underneath the uh, visitor serving commercial land use category in there. So um, that is something we could add, I suppose. Um, you know, we could add that as a category with a conditional use permit or something if there was interest there. Although, I mean, it needs need to have a CUP because there'd be some places where you wouldn't want them, mm -hmm. probably, you know, heavy commercial areas, things like that. Not probably appropriate. But, it know. just seems really important to protect the ones that we have. Um, that is a really, really important part of the affordable housing in this community. Well, they're, they're very difficult to convert, but yeah. Are they? Mm -hmm. do, do, there are. Yeah. Is that because of state law or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, certainly, you know, if you want to have it addressed in the code, we could add it to the land use table with a conditional use permit requirement. Um, would that mean that this park would need to get a conditional use permit after no, the fact? No, it's an existing. I don't know what permit, uh, what, what it permits it, it exists under currently. I don't know if it has a conditional use permit or a coastal development permit or, or what allowed it to be there. I, it's been there for a very long time, so, yeah. um, you know, I can't really remember, you know, the time when I'm coming to the city that it wasn't there. But, um, but yeah, we'd have to go back and do the research to say what, what, what was approved. I was just saying, you know, it, it's a land use category that we could add if we needed to, but. We okay. have the same situation over off of um, Tuscadero Road, uh, mm -hmm. over city over in there. Too, mm. so. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, I, I think our interest is to do what we can to, to ensure that it continues to exist as a mobile home park. So what you're, I don't pretend to understand what you really suggested, but what you're suggesting would make it more difficult to, uh, I, th I think it just adds it. So right now, so here's the here's the rub a little bit. You know, like if it's not in the use categories and it's not similar to other uses that are in those categories, then potentially it's considered nonconforming. Hmm. Legal nonconforming, right? correct? Technically, yeah. Yeah, legal nonconforming. I mean, again, there's. I mean, I, I'd have to go back and do all the research, but it's very difficult to convert mobile home parks, and we have rent control, you know, requirements and a mobile home rent control ordinance and you know those types of things. So there's a, there's a number of reasons why it's very difficult to convert them, um, both from a state law standpoint and, and from, from the mm -hmm. standards in the city's current municipal code. So would we be adding more protection if we included that? Well, I, 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 do think it, I, do think it's, I do think it's nice that you have it in there as an allowed use in the zone versus making it you know, non-conforming, uh, you know, albeit, as Cindy said, legal. Mm -hmm. Non-conforming, but uh, at least it's something that you could have in those zones, and it does pick up one of the other, you know, parks that we have, maybe two of them, in mm -hmm. um, as well. So it's not a, it's not a bad idea. I don't know if the prize provides any additional protection unless they come forward and get the CUP. Um, but you know, anything that would propose to convert it would also require permits. So, mm -hmm. yeah, nice. so for consistency, I would like to add that in. Yes, a conditional use in order to convert it. Well, that's already that there, but to add in the use in that zone um, that the visitor serving commercial could include the mobile home park since we have several parks apparently that are already in those zones. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the very least we could do since we're actually su supporting them and don't want them to be replaced. The very least we could do is designate them explicitly. Right. Does that work? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Everybody in agreement? Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. We will, we will certainly add that. Thank okay. you for that. Um, was another I think we've addressed uh, so I think we've addressed the code enforcement but as Ms. Winholt said it, it's sort of subject to the whims of what we can afford as a city 
But it, 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 that doesn't, is that something that could actually be in the zoning code? The it, it's pretty ineffectual, in my, in my opinion, to write it into the zoning code because yeah. the city makes the decision whether it enforces its code or not, and the code is going to tell us that we're going to have a code enforcement officer. The city could choose not to fund the position even if it was in there. Yeah. The, the, choose, the city can choose not to enforce its fence height requirements, as an example. I mean, it, it, there's, it's not a mandate. It can be enforced in the courts and things like that, but the city doesn't have to enforce them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know that it adds any protection into it. Okay. In, in, you know, in any case, I, I think it's putting the program together. Mm -hmm. and once the program's mm -hmm. put in place, then it, mm -hmm. replica, you know, it can be replicated, you know, by other folks. If we didn't have code enforcement officers, like yeah. planners could do it, or PD could help with it, or fire mm -hmm. could help with it. it mm -hmm. Like I said, we're going to work with fire, so we're not duplicating our efforts and going mm -hmm. out to these places twice. We don't need to do that. Right. Um, so we're going to work with them on coming up with checklists and things like that. So I mean, mm -hmm. so it sounds like we do have a code enforcement program in Morro Bay. Mm -hmm. It's just that the position's not necessarily, well, it hasn't. And the position's funded by the fees. Good, good. So like, mm -hmm. we would have, if we got rid of the position, we would have to reduce the fees. Yes. I mean, like, this, like the, whole, the whole process behind it doesn't, I mean, I think most people probably don't know this, but we can't charge fees that we don't provide the service for. So yeah. um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it as, you know, really protecting anything if you put it in there, it, you know. Yeah. Fairly Get it. Opinion. Yeah. But, Sounds good. Um, the fences, uh, Ms. Winholt's question about the difference between a modification versus a variance. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody were to approach the city about fence heights. So a, a modification can be approved by either the director or the planning commission. The, the modifications is a new term in our zoning code and, and those are, uh, the, in, the intent of that is uh, a way to grant relief from the standards of the code uh, when a variance would not be practical or mm -hmm. not possible because there are certain you know, state law um, uh, requirements when granting a variance. So it's really for these you know, minor, uh, minor things. And, and yes, the, the Planning Commission did in, in August say no increased fence heights and then at the September 6th meeting said, yeah, we're okay with an extra foot, but, but only um, you know, in that in the northeast one neighborhood. area, yeah. I, I recall um, Roche, mm -hmm. Vice Chair Roche, Roche and talking about neighborhood character. I mean, mm -hmm. cer certainly, you know, the commission can make a decision in the other direction if you wanted to this evening. It's, it's, it's up to your recommendation, the majority of you anyway. Um, I will say that I, I was able to speak with uh, Commissioner Roche before the meeting, um, and I, I, yes, he was kind of largely leading the the charge one about not having the increased, increased heights, you'll, maybe you'll recall this, about not having the increased heights that was, that was um, you know, that was suggested in the, in the draft code language. Um, and then moving fast forward to the second meeting when we were talking about it, said, oh, well, maybe it is appropriate in this area over here when you go over there and look at it. And then he did a full, between the, our last planning commission meeting and now, and did a full sort of reconnaissance of that, um, that neighborhood and thought it was an appropriate thing for the entirety of the area that Cindy described earlier, and that's the area north of Alva Paul Creek and east of Highway 1. Okay. And, sorry, Go I was ahead. just going to say that I think it was very late at the end of last meeting that we did um, make the choice to say mm -hmm. we would um, section off that specific area of town for allowances on height increase for the fence. So it was very late in the evening, which might have been after um, Betty was present. Mm -hmm. And could you address, um, and I know this is subject to change as well, but the, the fees that are involved with applying for a modification or a variance? Um, you're asking for what the fees would be? Yeah, somebody wants to build uh, a fence and needs a modification to go higher than. So if it's a, a modification approved at staff level, I don't have the exact dollar amount, um, but it's likely going to be in the 1500 to $2,000 range. Um, and I, I could look that up, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, or at least give, give a ballpark. Ball we, we, we will need to update the master fee schedule to include mm -hmm. references to these new permit names, because mm -hmm. it doesn't actually technically say that. Um, but, we, but we have like minor variances currently. Um, and then a, 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 if it goes to the planning commission modification, if it meets that test, um, you're likely looking at something that's gonna be uh, $4,000 or more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I, we, I just we, think that's important for people to understand yeah. that it's, it's 
even a director one if it's not going to mm -hmm. change. Yeah, we don't specifically have the, um, you know, the, the, as Cindy stated, the fees in the, in the current fee schedule because modification is in the permit in the, <laughs> in the current zoning code. Um, we, uh, we will be looking at it, though, potentially. We are actually in the process of um, looking at it. Uh, doing, we're doing a cost allocation plan, or will be, and we'll also be doing a fee study update, probably fast forward, uh, be starting it maybe summer next year potentially if mm -hmm. we move forward uh, okay. and it would it, it would actually tell us the time that would spent associated with that so we would know the exact cost of it so we're not okay. charging too much and little. and just to so to clarify where i came up with these two numbers i'm basing that on our current fee schedule how what our typical admin director level permits tend to cost and right. what it costs any you know they're it's roughly the same amount of time so i'm just mm -hmm. kind of i'm assuming that it's going to be similar to our current Okay. Yeah, and I, and I agree with what Sam yeah. said. Those numbers Appreciate seem that. about right. So. Joe. You know, with, with respect to the, the fence heights, I recall in the draft zoning agreement, there's something, something to the effect of, and the, the fence maximum could be raised two feet, I believe, on administrative discretion in extraordinary situations. I, I think I remember reading something like that. And, and the, what I'd like to suggest, if, if if that's in the, uh, the proposed zoning document, then that should come to the Planning Commission um, rather than the department's discretion, just because it's so highly, seems to be so highly politicized that I'd sort of like to take that responsibility. And uh, it also ensures that people are really interested in doing this, and for good reason, because they have to come to the Planning Commission. Am I, am I correct in that it, the provision it, is in there? It does say that, that that's a type of exception that the director may allow additional height up to two feet where the location or characteristics of the site warrant additional height for safety or security purposes. Yeah, um, that's, that's what I'm getting. I'd, I'd like that to come to the commission again. And, and it's certainly not in, the, in that I, I don't lack any confidence in your decision, but I can, I can imagine it would be politicized and perhaps even angry, and I'd rather they come to us than to you guys. So I'm going to go back to the thing that we were just talking about. The cost of the permit um, is going to be minimum $4,000 to $5,000 for somebody to do something along those lines. Um, so to you know, give some consideration of whether you think that's appropriate for something that isn't going to cost anywhere near that probably to build. Um, and what you're talking about normally in circumstances like this is areas where you have slopes, retaining walls, retaining walls exposed on one side, covered on the other side where it's retaining the slope, right? So, um, and in some instances, um, you know, we have to do this thing in our code um, now where you have to, you're required, if you can walk up to it, to have a 42 inch high railing on it, a guardrail. And so when the exposed height on the opposite side of that fence is going to exceed the fence height in the, in the city, um, we fall back on the, it's a, it's a building code requirement and you're required to do it. So we don't do anything special related to the permitting component of it. So. Those are the scenarios where we run into it, is really when you have this sort of, oftentimes when you have this sloped land, there's a retaining wall that's put in place, and the exposed outer portion of it might be four feet tall, it might be five feet tall, um, and you, have, you want a fence along your property line. So that's usually when it comes into play. Um, and I think under any circumstance, it would be notice, noticed, so to the neighbors, 500 feet, so. Yeah, and that, that section in the code also talks about uh, a minor use permit would be approved. So there are certain commercial uses that are required to be screened, and sometimes um, the, the height is just not enough based on, like, maybe they need a certain kind of generator and the manu you know, manufacturer, like, they tried to find something that will fit, be fully uh, screened within it. Uh, if you recall, there was a, a wireless application the Planning Commission looked at a year or two ago off of Radcliffe where they needed a, a fence height exception because just the equipment wasn't tall enough. Um, it certainly wouldn't be for a flat lot in the island street to say, you want a seven foot tall fence? Oh sure, the director can give you an extra two feet. Like, that, that's not what this is about. It's really, like Scott said, uh, when you have extenuating circumstances. Okay, I see. So if I I'm reading what you say. You're you're comfortable making those distinctions. They don't come up that often, and usually they're you know in relation to, to topographical constraints on the site. I w I've been here for eight years, and mm -hmm. um, we've had a couple of them come up over time. I mean that's that's about it, and and it really was related to building code requirements. On the one side, if you limited it to the six feet, you would have a retaining wall that was four and a half, five feet tall, with a two two and a half foot 
railing on top of it, which made no sense um, and didn't provide the protection that was required by the building code. Um, so um, that's kind of the areas where we, we would use it. Um, again, we notice it, so the neighbors get noticed, and you know, if, certainly mm -hmm. if they're unhappy with it, then, then they, they could appeal the decision um, from a staff standpoint. But when, you, when you're doing something like that, you would want to be, from a staff standpoint anyway, uh, not unlike the commission, taking in that input going, okay, what's the issue that's being raised? Is this a real issue? You know, I mean, like we, we look at it just like you do. I mean, just, there's not five of us debating it, but there's usually three or four of us talking about it internally when we do. Um, so anyway, if that helps. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I would hesitate to put that financial burden on the citizens well, for something that. It would be effectively, it would be the same effectively as not allowing that height because of the cost of planning coming to the planning commission. Well, that's that's true, but I, I want there to be a, a high barrier and a very good reason. But uh, but uh, you know I'm I'm in agreement that mm -hmm. the, the department you know has the same values that we do. And, yeah. You know, so I'm fine. Okay. Yes. Oh, Mike, I'm, I hear I'm ready you to, rumbling well, over here. Well, I want to kind of return now to where we started at our first meeting and kind of try to go back to top ten and then make some formal you know, to have formal discussions and maybe make formal motions that we haven't done yet. And I'd like to start with three. Number three, which if you could go back to your original presentation, Cindy, which three is commercial heights. We've all heard about commercial heights, right? We, we discussed it, we kind of tabled it, Joe. And then we talked about coming up with a design district and putting two planning commissioners on that district, design district, to further study height but height will not be you know 37 feet will not be what we recommend we're going to recommend that there be a design district put together with two planning commissioners who will further study this and i didn't see that in the in memorialized in your your notes so i want it i want it to be i want there to be we're going to propose a design district that will have two planning commissioners on it with as well as maybe a Somebody else, I don't know. Yeah, We're, it's, it's at our level. So, and I would recommend that, I've talked to some people about that and commissioners as to whether they would be willing to serve on that district. And I got two people who said they would. And Commissioner Roshan's the one that kind of put it forward. So he's not here tonight. So that's why I didn't feel comfortable. But I did talk to, to, to him about it. And he says that he still wants that design district. Yeah. And he wants it, well, he wants the, you know, formal committee. Right, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's on the slide. So we'll go ahead and appoint, now I'm ready to make a motion to put I, two planning commissions so, on it. So I think um, at this time where we're talking about the zoning code and, and yeah. you know, you can correct me, but I would like to see us sort of finish discussing the parts, but I don't think we're going to be making motions on every individual part. Oh, no. We right. will make a motion yeah. to forward yeah. Yeah. The recommendation to city council or not? Yeah, and, and we're and we're happy um, to, Commissioner Rodriguez, yeah. um, Chairperson Stewart. We're happy to after you finished your discussions about things you may want additional changes mm -hmm. you may want yeah. to go back in the format of this and go through them and say this is where we're, we'll be making this change, this added change mm -hmm. underneath this section, and we'll yeah. walk, we'll walk you through that right. if that yeah. seems yeah. like that makes yeah. sense, and then you can. Based yeah. on that, you can make an overall um, recommendation right. uh, motion. And, and but I definitely yeah. agree. We do want to make sure at some point in this meeting we uh, we don't leave that hanging too mm -hmm. much longer. Right. Yeah. That whole yeah. idea of a dis, you know developing yeah. a committee to look at what those recommendations would be for that part of town. Yeah, and we both agree, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, that that was the direction of, mm -hmm. of, of the planning commission, and so. Yeah. Assuming you agree to make that recommendation, it'll be stated that way yeah, when perfect. we move it forward to city council. That'll also provide a trail for the planning commission to follow up on. That's it, right. Also right. to let the city council know what happened. Yeah, because right. I wanted to make a formal motion, therefore, that uh, we appoint two planning commissioners at this point that have shown a desire to do this. And that would be Commissioner Roshan, who asked me to do this, as well as Commissioner Ingrafia, to that subcommittee. So I'm making that motion okay. to put two planning commissioners formally on that committee. So that kind of puts some meat on it because this is very important. Yeah, right. We've tabled this as a bit very important discussion issue to study moving forward in order to resolve right. everybody's concerns. And, and you can also, as Scott was saying, like make at the end of the night, make one motion and say, these are like, we want these eight things. We want yeah. these 15 things or and whatever the, number the, the of thing things. The thing about like, that is, Cindy, is I don't know if we're all gonna agree 
we're all going to come. <laughs> we, we only have four of us now. Okay, fair enough. You, you, no, I want this one because height is, commercial height is going to be a big, big one. And I want to take a formal vote that shows the council that we want a committee of at least two planning commissioners that serve to study this moving forward. I want to take the vote on that. We should have done it our first meeting. We almost did it. But remember, we kind of said, well, let's wait till the end. Like Cindy's saying, problem is we're not all going to agree on every eight or nine things, possibly. So I'd like to do this, especially on, com on height, commercial height, Joe. I'd like to move it so that. Well, I have some things to add to it. Sure, sure. But, to but I just thought I'd throw it out there. So I, I wanted to make that motion. If there's no second, that's fine. But I wanted to formally make that motion. Well, I, I think if, I think what Susan was saying was that if we if we went through this list of what we agree on and maybe some additions, we we need to sort of see we may in fact agree on everything, and that that simplifies it. But we might wait to see if there is okay. you know unanimity. Okay, so I don't have a problem with that, just as long as number one will be committee, yeah. which Commissioner and Graffia and Commissioner Roshan have agreed to serve. So that's number one. So let's now march through, but I just wanna make sure we don't lose track of what we're trying to do here. And let's vote on all of it and then move it up. All I'm saying is we can do it piecemeal, one at a time, or we can do it all at once. But the chance of waiting to do it all at once is we may, all, may not all agree on certain areas. I, I think you know, the light, I, I think there's nothing wrong with having disagreements and feeling like there are parts of this you know, we stand completely behind in parts where a little uncertain. I think one of the, the things that is so great about this process is there will be flexibility in it. There will be opportunities to put it to work and things that may not look right once we get into the real yeah. world with it or things where codes change, laws mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. It's adjustable. Sure. So I'm not too concerned about you know, obviously we have a community where some like fence heights going up, some don't. Yeah. Um, I think um, we're not going to get to 100%. Yeah. And I think that's okay. Yeah. I think we're as being as responsive as we can be. To but we are going to go through them in summary. Yeah. And yes, we, we will have, have a summary. To, mm -hmm. um, adjust before the end of the night right. before voting on it. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, did you have another comment, Asia, that you wanted to make on all that? Just on that particular topic that I can mm -hmm. want to take it. Okay. Which, so. which topic, Asia? The height. Mm -hmm. Oh, the height. Okay. We're not there yet. I thought we were going to. Um, yeah. I would like us to go back to the idea of um, hotels in oh. Our RH zones. I, I still ha I still have an, a, a suggestion sure. for the accessory structures. We, we talked about fences and, oh, and so the, uh, I'm I'm reading under under the, the synopsis of what we tentatively thought we wanted at the last meeting, and it's um, the the accessory structure would uh, not within the side setback area adjacent to the residents, okay? I also want to make sure that this structure is not adjacent to the neighbor's residence, which may not be synonymous. Oh. Um, mm. So, Good point. Uh, and, and in fact, I remember suggesting that I thought the whole idea would only be appropriate for what I considered small lots, 3,500 square feet or less, Meaning the larger lots could accommodate their structures, uh, you know, within the normal setbacks. Um, and I'm kind of hard pressed, you know, not to advocate for that. Um, so, um, be good for maybe the commission to visualize what that looks like. So, some lots in the areas of town, the rear setback is 10 feet. No place to put a shed. House is at 10 feet. In fact, that's the normal situation. In areas in the town where we have setbacks that are three feet on the sides and five on the rear, there's very little room to put a shed there. 
Um, so you really got a picture, like if there's, and then there's, there's actually room in it, what you've now done is taking the shed, putting it, either maybe it's at five feet or it's at 10 feet, but it ends up being somewhat in the middle of the yard, which is a little strange as well. But I mean, I don't, it's kind of, up, it's up to you. If you want to make that, uh, that change, you certainly can. Um, just wanted you to kind of be cognizant of what that actually looks like on a piece of property when you're thinking about this. And these are structures under 120 square feet. Anything that is 120 square foot is subject to all the, over 120 square foot or more are subject to the, um, the setback requirements of the zone. So these are relatively small. So, so essentially what you're saying is the, the, the 3,500 square foot lot isn't, isn't a great division because you can have a larger lot with a, a smaller backyard and create some miserable situations. It's, it's, it's really a, a feature of the current development standards and the way the houses have developed. You know, a lot of them developed that rear property line. And so if you're meeting the, the setbacks for the house, which is normal, then yeah. they'll, they'll be run up against the rear setback oftentimes, and there's really no place for them to put it. Um, so, and, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, what that does is it creates a situation that we have out there right now, which is there are a lot of, you know, sheds and storage structures that are illegal. So, it's, I think about it because I'm the one that has to go and enforce them. Right. <laughs> but, but, that, but, but the, the notion of at least uh, um, not having the, uh, the uh, structure um, not adjacent to the neighbor's house. Yeah. Okay, I mean, so so that's so that's interesting. So I'm not sure. So the idea was that, that we had talked about previously. So this is nuanced, I think. Um, was that we're not going to have it in the in the um, the example that we had was uh, the house that was next to um, Dr. Garcia's house, um, where they put the shed uh, in the side setback. It went all the way over to the fence. And in fact, at one point, like it was kind of draining water onto Dr. Garcia's property, but we fixed that. Um, and it was almost right up against the house. Um, so planning commission is like, we don't want that, and fair. So that would push the shed beyond the back of the house. And it sounds like, uh, Commissioner Graffia, that you're saying, okay, it's fine, it's beyond the back of the house, but it still shouldn't be in the side setback against that fence? No, I, I'm, what I'm saying is in, in that example, um, so if the neighbor had moved his shed so that it was further into the lot, um, so it wasn't uh, up against, it wasn't uh, in the alleyway against his house, mm -hmm. but it would end up, there'd be, the, there'd be the structure, the fence, and then there would be the neighbor's house. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid also, uh, I'm trying to avoid a situation where there is house, setback, fence, and then this offending structure. And sometimes if the two houses aren't exactly aligned, one is further back. So this fellow could put his shed there. And well, one might argue that you would actually want it there if you were the person with the house that was further back because then you wouldn't have to look at it. Because <laughs> when you move back here, then you can see it. If it's sitting on the side of your house, you know, kind of like the situation. Um, no, no, but that's, but that's my point. If, if, if Dr. Garcia's house had extended further, if Dr. Garcia's house was set further back, okay, so, so the, and, and the, neighbor had then placed his structure so that it wasn't next to his house, it was further in the backyard, but now it ended up bordering. Yeah, being across from where his house extended to, that's what I'm saying, like, uh, one might argue that the exact opposite is that was what, of, of that is what you would prefer, because to say you're in your backyard, right, and you put this shed along your side property line past your house, so it's sitting there, um, and your neighbor can see it if his backyard, you know, is open. Say you both have the same rear setback and your house is sitting in the same location. You put it back there, your neighbor can see it. If your neighbor's house extends further beyond it and you put it here, it's blocked from the backyard of your neighbor's house, which might be actually preferred. I mean, they probably don't want to look at it at all. I don't know. Well, I don't know. There was, a, there was, the, there was the objection that when he, you know, looked out his window, he saw a fence and then he saw the roof of this structure creeping over that fence right up against it. That's what I, I was, hmm. I was, I was trying, you know, to provide something that was considerate to the neighbors. Am I, am I making myself at all clear? I, I, I understand. I understand exactly what you're saying, Commissioner Graffia, and uh, I was just saying that it, it might be desirable to have it the other way. I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to agree with me. I'm just saying that might be something as well. I don't know. Something that the commission should talk about and discuss if you want to go down that road. Well, I've, I've made my, my cause. 
you guys think about it. I guess I'm comfortable with the idea that we have tried to remove that sort of imposition of a neighbor's shed on in your adjacency to your house um, and, and put it in the backyard if possible, or at least put it back from the house. I get what you mean that lots could be staggered and mm -hmm. I, the houses could be staggered and, um, but, you know, boy, at some point we, we just have to try and be good neighbors yeah. <laughs> and talk to each other about what we're doing and our impacts on each other. Um, that's yeah, like Pollyanna. And, and I don't think you're gonna find very many examples where you have a shed right in the setback where there's no space in case of an emergency, the mm -hmm. fire department, well, maybe we talked about all that. Right. How are they gonna get through there when you have a shed right in the setback? Well, no, I'm, I'm, in the fence. I, I don't want that, clearly I don't want exactly. that. Exactly, I get what you're talking about. So I, I, and I agree with Susan that we talked about it to the point where I'm sure Scott will move it up and say something to the next level. I feel comfortable yeah. with what we arrived at at our last meeting on that, personally. Um, so. so Pose something to Susan, because yeah. I did talk to Commissioner Roshan because he couldn't make it, but he gave me these two items. Regarding the fence, you know, he said he did meet with Scott and you guys kind of talked about the north part of Morro Bay and there being a carve out. I don't want to call it a carve out, but a, a section where the fences could be allowed, you know, additional height. So again, you know, are we gonna approve that as a whole or are we just gonna talk about it? I don't, all I'm saying is I, I, I like that concept, especially since he spent a lot of time, you spent a lot of time. There seems to be agreement that in certain parts, a certain part of Morro Bay, it would work, mm -hmm. this additional height. So do we as a commission now vote to approve that as a whole? I, I think that becomes part of our recommendation and when Cindy reads back yeah. what we've so, gone through with the so adjustments, then we vote once. Because Commissioner Roshan, since he was in here, asked me to make that formal. So we can memorialize that as it goes to council. It's it's so it's in it's in the top ten. It's mm -hmm. described there. So so the, the we'll, we'll go back through those with you, and then we can stop by each one to make sure we're all understanding okay. what we're doing. Yeah. And like some of the ones where we say, oh, well, you accepted all the changes. We already have one right now that we're changing now. That's the land use categories um, for uh, um, for mobile uh, for mobile home parks mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for the visitor serving commercial to allow that. That's mm -hmm. one that's in Chapter 1708. Yeah. Um, so that's an area that you've already we've already in the, in yeah. the slide said, oh, we're yeah. good, but, but we're going to we'll come back and say it. we're not yeah. good. Yeah. We're going to make a change. Yeah. And the reason I said that, Scott, is because he said that he had gone with you to you know kind of verify that this would work in that area. So. Now we're having this meeting, and so we have a specific area, and that should be identified. It's 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 called out in the top. It's called it's called Good. out in the slides. Slide so slide. that's all I'm saying is okay. these are the yeah. Yeah. probably the top two things that he was most concerned about since he can't be here. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I think we probably need to go back to. Um, do you want to talk about the commercial heights a little bit more? Sure. I didn't yeah. know if the um, if we had gotten clarity on the RH discussion. Yes, I would like to go Be back to because that. Because that's not in the top 10, I don't think, was it? it well, that's in It was housing. in comments. It, was, it, was, it related, came up in, in the comments, yeah. 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 So I thought before going over the top 10, it might be <laughs> nice to address that. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Because maybe I'm confused now, but that wouldn't that also fall under housing, that discussion? No, it's not. It's, our, it, it, of course, it's related to housing, but yeah. really, it's making the change in the land use table. So when I say land use table, there's the list of allowed uses, yeah. and one of those in the residential high density um, residential high density area is, is hotel motel use. And so you could simply, if it's the desire of at least three of you, strike it. It's a simple change. I I have a desire to strike it. Yeah. Anybody else? I see Joe nodding. Mike. Yeah. yeah. So for clarity, this would mean that like the area we, this is the same area we looked at with the transitional, um, like when we looked at the hotel 
um, unhosted hotel the other week that we approved. Is this that same? <laughs> yeah, certainly, of course, you ask about that location. <laughs> um, so that location has an entirely different zoning classification okay. under the current, it's moving into the draft code. Um, it did, we, tra we went away from the, um, the R4 concept, and it is now in, in, well, RM. RM, residential medium density. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, it changes in the, in, the, in the draft code to residential um, medium density. So. Mm -hmm. so right now we're talking about R H. H. Yeah. So can someone pull up where we're talking about that specifically to create a visual? Do you have a visual by chance? So there's this. And it, we would be taking what's actually a pretty limited amount of parcels and striking out the ability to put so or Scott, the land use of. I think Scott's going to see if we can get something mm -hmm. on the screen here. But basically, what that, that would be uh, not allowing um, hotels, motels in RH zones. They would be allowed in other zones, per whatever that zone district standard is, um, and. I'll just give this commentary while Scott's working. And Cindy, can I, this is why I got a little confused, but that would provide possibly more housing opportunities uh, if those aren't allowed in those zone, in that RH. So in other words, instead it, of doing that, you could build more housing. I mean, indirectly, yeah. It's, yeah. Just, it's basically just saying this, what you're allowed, we're updating what's allowed in that zone district. So you're, you're not allowing hotels, motels. Um, if somebody owns um, a piece mm -hmm. of property that's zoned RH, then um, that's one less opportunity for them to develop their lot. But they can build housing in yes. RH. That's why I want to make yeah. sure it so, did relate to housing. Yeah. I think the important thing, Mike, is yeah. um, if somebody owns a property yeah. and wants to develop it and they can do a motel, yeah. their ROI, the return on investment, may be tremendously larger than if they do housing and especially if they do mm -hmm. um, workforce affordable housing. So if they're given the option, it's very likely that they would choose um, no, so what's going to make well, them more money. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is we want these areas to be held to a different standard mm -hmm. of development yeah. that we would like them to continue yeah. or, or become and, housing yeah, only yeah. and and yeah and so it's it's basically saying that you know i think one of the one of the members of the community said like it's preserving this high density residential the intent is that it be used for for high density residential that's right mm -hmm. yeah that's so the point what are story. all of the uses currently allowed can we list those in in the rh uh -huh. um i can look that up hold on Sorry, put in. It's okay. And, and while Cindy is doing that, I might add it's it's a it's a not as strong an argument, but if it was originally put into the zoning code as a transition, mm -hmm. um, I think pretty clearly operating a hotel is a little harsher on the neighborhood than an apartment building is, and for that reason alone, if we're seeking transition, it should be the easiest transition to residential and. I think that would not be hotels, but rather multi-unit apartments. So um, RH uh, allows uh, single-unit developments, uh, two-unit developments, multi-unit residential accessory dwelling units, employee housing, uh, daycare, both small and large, uh, group residential, mobile home parks, uh, mm -hmm. residential care facilities, small and large, um, supportive housing, transitional housing, uh, public and semi-public uses, daycare centers, parks and recreation facilities, parking lots, schools, social services, uh, farmers markets, uh, hotels and motels right now, but that will mm -hmm. potentially mm -hmm. we're moving that. Um, offices, uh, again, transitional area, so it does allow for some commercial things that would serve the, you know, the residences of there and reflective of the areas they're located in. Mm -hmm. Um, community gardens, uh, market gardens, uh, private gardens, all kinds of gardens. Um, and that's about it. Great. And it's and it's it, and those are like use categories. So there's all the things that kind of fit inside totally. of it. Totally. We kind of changed it to be less specific and more like category-ish. I guess. Mm -hmm. 
thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I'm in agreement to strike mm -hmm. out hotel, motel. So that's four of us here. Yep, so I, so we can add that, Cindy, to mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Anything else we want clarification on? Mm -hmm. So I think we've, we've pretty well established that um, we do want to um, develop this design district subcommittee, some kind of group. Um, do, do you need more specifics on who we would recommend for that? Um, right, I mean, right now, I mean, I think we would start with the, the subcommittee on planning commissioning, have it, you know, have a, I would have a meeting, you know, offline with the subcommittee, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. work through some of those things. Mm -hmm. I would strongly recommend getting some other community members in on that. And, and I think, yeah, I think that was the discussion that we had originally. Yeah, I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to be, you know, two planning commissioners. I'm also hoping that we can put a um, deadline, a date of mm -hmm. some kind on that project. Will that depend on council approving this? That's why I want to, yeah, yeah. We, we'd have to have the initial conversation and then make the request the subcommittee right. form based right. on the new uh, regs. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we can do that much as I would like to, but um, you know, if we get this approved tonight and it mm -hmm. goes to council, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. hopefully by spring, sometime yeah. we could be. And my my whole desire, Susan, by discussing this offline with each commissioner, was to make sure that obviously, if their names are attached to this, mm -hmm. they'll take a special interest in following it, tracking it, and you know, because of the community's concern about well, commercial fight. And I would like to recommend that we don't decide who's on the committee tonight. Okay. Well, I, yeah. I would agree with that and be real careful about discussing, no, no, you know, having a no, serial meeting. No, just if, if people would be willing, like mm -hmm. I said, to serve, and that actually happened mm -hmm. on this table, mm -hmm. you know, when we discussed it, it's only because um, of the community's interest mm -hmm. and desire to get this issue resolved as soon as possible, we took 37 out. So that doesn't eliminate, because you have the other end of it, where you have the commercial folks saying, well, wait a minute, what are you doing to us, right? So we have two, two players here to look at as far as like what we're trying to do. So I wanna make sure it's fully studied and we flush out the issue. Right, so I think we'll have that reflected okay. in, in the notes. Okay, yes, Joe. I have a question for Scott, I just remembered this. Um, that peculiar anomaly of the uh, commercial zoning on the east of the of the freeway off ramp and the roundabout that that area. There's a sort of a commercial zone landlocked by agricultural. The Tri W's. Property. Oh yeah. So I mean, I think I have the map, I have the map up on the screen. It, uh, that's there is is there a, that, that's, that's so odd and. It's going to be continued in this version of the zoning code. I'm, I'm assuming because there's nothing we can really do about it. It, it was created by referendum. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's it's still reflected that way. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, we have that recent interest from the at least some members of the of the uh, owning family of doing something there related to commercial use, which was hmm. surprising. But we haven't heard back from them recently. But they did make contact. I don't know, six eight months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we don't have the ability to change it. Uh, that would only the only way we could change that would be uh, through a vote of the, uh, the people, citizens. I, I just think that so many people in Morro Bay would be so surprised to learn that a particularly visible piece of property, you know, opposite the on ramp and off ramps, is liable someday to be commercially developed. That is uh, that is uh, oftentimes uh, the, uh, the comments that I get. Why would you put it there? Well, you have to understand there's a, little, there's a whole history behind it. Yeah. Um, and not a surprising one, you know, given, you know, the city's lack of water resources back in the, the day and the size of project that was proposed out there. I, and again, back in the timing when that was happening, uh, referendums were sort of the, you know, the cool thing to do back right. then. So so there, so there isn't, uh, this this board can't recommend to do anything about uh, it. I mean, it would literally have to be something that the council would decide to, to take to the citizens, you know, in a, in a, okay. for a vote, so. Okay, are we ready? I think we're ready. I'm gonna sort of run us through our 10, make sure we've got it captured. 10 plus. Plus what happened tonight. Oh, yeah. Of course, it happened all along. Did 
you want me to just go through? Okay, so mm -hmm. here we are at um, these two chapters. Um, and um, again, this is staff's top 10 changes. Any, any recommend? I'll, I'll let you discuss. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're good with just yeah. continuing on with these. Yep. Okay. Uh, commercial Heights. And this one, we just wanted to be sure that um, the council is clear that we want to see um, a committee form to sort of review and, and create a design district idea and look at what might be the mm -hmm. best uses. Now, I, I, I wonder since, see, I, I have no idea. What we're dealing with here is so complicated and detailed and I don't know exactly how how it's going to be presented to the council. I, what are they What are they going to see that explains what we mean and why we want a design district? Um, well, I, I think I, I think the, the planning commission wants a more deliberate process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, you know to determine you know where and where where is it appropriate to go to 37 feet you know like and have some more engagement on the subject remember this policy came up many years ago right it's been in the zoning code for like since like 2018 or something or maybe before that even um so it hasn't been something that's been recently vetted by the community other than folks showing up at the meetings here mm -hmm. you know for the adoption hearings in front of planning commission so um you know not a not a horrible idea you know to, to you know check back in and and again, to have a more deliberate process to develop maybe what the parameters would be to do something on that, at that higher level. And then what that looks like. And is there areas where it's appropriate in the downtown for 37 feet and where it's not? I think that's a, that's a pretty easy thing to, to, to describe to the council. And I think something that, that would resonate with them, I assume. So. Yeah. Is there any, is there any restraint um, from one or more or all of us uh, appearing before the council to Ask, answer their questions or, or advocate or? I mean, you, you could certainly decide to come and speak at the, you know, at the, at the city council meeting where it's being adopted and, um, you know, and if you wanted to provide context of the, you know, the process um, or the decision making, you know, that was behind that, ch that request to change, you could certainly do that or you could simply speak as citizen and gratia and, <laughs> uh, you know, mm -hmm. provide your opinion. So it's, it depends on how you guys want to do it, but you certainly could, you know, mm -hmm all attend, one of you attend or whatever to provide, you know, the opportunity to, you know, speak to why the changes were made if you felt it necessary, you know, based on how but staff presents. Yeah, we're we're going to give a presentation mm -hmm. similar to this. Um, it's going to be based off your format because your format resulted in changes to the document. So that, that's what we're going to do. We're kind of going to do this top 10 cha changes plus the other changes. We'll go through them. There'll be some discussion as to why they were made um, and uh, why the recommendation. Um, the zoning code, um, version that you review will be updated and change to track changes for your edits. Um, so it's very clear what you're asking for and what the language looks like. So they get to see the language and um, discussion will go from there. Mm, great. I, I sometimes, you know, it might be the difference between by analogy, you know, a text message and an elaborate phone call. Um, <laughs> it only, I say that only because, you know, this is such a large document and it's going to last for so long. and and. Um, I mean, there's both, there's both staff there, you know, myself, yeah. Cindy will mm -hmm. be there, uh, Martha, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then there's your council liaison who watches all of the meetings, yeah. uh, oh. uh, Council Member Heller. Um, so and he's always very interested in, you know, initiatives that are raised by the Planning Commission and supporting this. He does a good job of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think he regularly reaches out to you to, to support you in your, your endeavors. So I think you get, you get all of that, and then certainly, you know, you could also attend if you if you're Yeah, you know, one of the things, uh, too, Scott, is the fact that planning is a never-ending process. This is a sidebar we're going to have and bring it back. Mm -hmm. So we discussed that. We, you know, we can't resolve this now, but that doesn't mean we can't move the document. And the good, thing, the good part about it is there's other things that we need to bring forward, things we need, we need to fix that can't just be fixed as part of this process. That's right. It involves some other changes to the, the, the um, general plan as well. So, yeah. um, you know, we're going to have some, like, cleanup amendments that trail behind this. You'll be seeing those. Um, so, you could do, you know, so I think it's, I think it's appropriate. And we have a mechanism for it. And it's something we already anticipate. So I don't see much good. of an issue there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I think we're ready to move forward we go from the back one slide. Back one slide. Yes. Okay. Um, so we said, you know, development standard 1707, we're good. We're not good, right? So we're changing right. two right. things mm. in, in that chapter. We're changing the, um, 
or removing the uh, hotel allowance in right. the RH zone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're under 1708, we're, remove, we're adding the uh, mobile home park as a conditionally permitted use in the visitor serving commercial zone. So now, you know, that number two item there, you have two changes okay. that'll be moving forward in that. Okay, so everybody, we agree. Does everybody agree? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, so you had yeah. nods? Yep. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, thank you for that. You just uh, kept your job, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. See, we need you for a reason. Uh, Appreciate right. that. Okay, so moving on to the number four, fence heights and accessory structures. Mm -hmm. I think we, we've discussed that mm -hmm. and are in agreement with this um, four-foot height in mm -hmm. the Alva Paul East yeah. of Highway 1. So definitely we'd like a final confirmation, some head nods from all of you that you're good with that yes. change for that one location. Everywhere else stays the same. Yeah. Yep. Foot, four foot, but that area would, would get the extra. Four foot, five foot, uh, 50 percent. In that, yeah, in that one area, in that one area, in the, uh, North Morno Bay over there, north mm -hmm. of Alva Paul. And, uh, and then I think also the accessory structures yep. and mm -hmm. yep. keeping mm -hmm. off the fence line the between fence. houses. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we had anything in five, six, or seven. That was new? No. Okay. Uh, and then in eight, don't think we had anything there. No. And nine, the housing. Um, so that change, I think, Joe, was something you were concerned with that we allow in lieu fees to be put to their best and highest uses, even if it was outside of the city, but first apply in the city if possible. Was that pretty much yeah. what was captured in the mm -hmm. staff report? So yeah. we're all comfortable with that? Yep, mm -hmm. okay. And then- yeah, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a funny look from uh, Commissioner King. I mean, with, I agreed that if, with that added note about prioritizing the city of Morro Bay. I don't love this, but I mm. see the wisdom in it, so. The, the, the interesting part, and I think that, uh, you know, I'll call it the cool factor of this, is we're doing a lot of regional work right now. Yeah, that's it. Um, both on homelessness and housing. Um, we meet regularly on both of those topics with the jurisdictions in the county, including the county. Um, so, and there's these types of conversations in those, in those groups are happening, you know, about mm -hmm. how can we, you know, pool resources to do things? How do we do things on our own? Where does it make sense to do these things? So, mm -hmm. it does, if, it, if it helps at all, I mean, it's not something that's, it's not well. Uh, it's not like it's a possible, not a possibility. It is things that allows a little bit of flexibility that might support efforts that are ongoing right now. Um, yeah. And so I don't, I don't know that it'll come forward or it'll happen, but it, at least it does provide some flexibility to do some things regionally that we might not otherwise be able to do. Yeah, and I agree, Scott, because at our last meeting we talked about that that we would do this on a regional approach and apply this in Morro Bay first yeah. when possible. But it, it's a regional issue. But so. low-income people deserve to live by the ocean, too. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. they do. I agree. Oh. All right. And we've decided we're throwing out all the state law updates. We can <laughs> ignore them and no, no following caution state to law. the wind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're kind of stuck with that. Um, anything else? I'll, although, can I clarify that, Scott? So state law passes. We're not going to see changes probably till January 1st. 2023 is when they're all going to start landing and hitting the books, but you will come back to us and say, by the way, by the way, by so, the way, so we will probably as projects come forward. We'll let you know, um, and maybe depending on what comes forward and when it does, there that some of the timing of th some things are, are, are pushed out a little bit. Now, mm -hmm. Normally, a lot of times it's January 1, but That's right. there's a few things that are, you know, actually take place in uh, July, I think, July 1. Um, so. We'll have some information on that, and as those things, you know, are either signed by the governor um, or whatnot, we'll be probably incorporating those changes into our cleanup amendments as well, so that we can make this thing as up to date as we can. Because <laughs> we, we're constantly chasing our tails, and I know that there's also um, some, uh, you know, likely uh, changes um, to ADU law again. So we're literally going to be pushing this across the finish line right mm -hmm. after making additional ads. But hopefully, it doesn't wow. make yeah. anything in it in our current code. Um, that the draft code um, doesn't, uh, you know, preempt anything that's in there. Yeah, because um, the reason I asked Scott is because we're going to approve it. It's going to be published, and then we'll go back and have to redo it again. And then we're going to have to go back and have to redo it again, in, you know, after July. So all I'm saying is it's, that's what I meant about it's never an ending process because the state legislature is doing things, the governor wants things done that we're going to have to implement, maybe. 
mile, and it's you know you think about all the you know the housing bills and things that are sure. out there. We're going to be doing this constantly. There's going to be changes, you know, moving forward. We're not producing enough housing, so this is going to continue. Like every time they identify a roadblock, the legislature is trying to change it. Like, That's right. You know, like make it by right or whatever it is. Remove the discretionary process from local jurisdictions as it relates to the housing, so it streamlines the process, and you get a lot less like not in my backyard stuff. So. I think that's going to continue probably for the next several years. Yes. Okay. Commissioners, are there any other items you wanted to make sure we addressed? And, and Chairperson Stewart, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, for this um, item on the screen, there mm -hmm. should be a decision by the commission if you want to make uh, the recommended uh, text edit to this uh, paragraph A and okay. G. This is um, uh, to tie it back to the general plan implementation. And I would recommend that we do since it does tie back to the general plan, and we all agreed kind of initially, but I would agree that, and it was good text, good language. I, I thought it, he did a good job. It, of it was good. It's nice yeah. having retired uh, yeah. ex planning director yeah. in the community. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, no, I, so you want us to nod our heads, Scott, or just? Yeah, so I'm just lying. I'm, I'm, I'm yes. seeing, uh, seeing a majority. Let's do it. it, was, Let's uh, do it. Yeah, it was good, so yeah, thank you. Can Did we address whether or not we wanted to go back on the short-term rental percentage of 12.5% on multifamily housing? I know, I think Cindy brought that up. Did we want to readdress that at all? And that's just multifamily housing in commercial and mixed-use zones. Multifamily housing in multifamily zone, regular multifamily zones cannot be used. Not right. be used, right. okay. Hmm. And, uh, and Chairperson Stewart uh, may, you know, have some input related to the committee that was formed as she was on it um, and where some of this language came from and the allowances. She might be able to shed some light on that if it's useful. Uh, it, it, useful? Be, it would be useful <laughs> for me to, as to, um, I guess, just some clarity around there was, what the purpose uh, is. Some, there was a lot of concern with limiting the number of vacation rentals in neighborhoods. So um, it was reduced not as drastically as some of us would have liked and more drastically than others would have liked who are on this committee. So what was looked at was that in commercial areas, you could basically have unlimited vacation rentals because they're very similar to hotels. If you think about, um, is it on Pacific, that little, um, it's a little development right that all little water. houses before you get down to the garden gallery, yep. um, they're all vacation rentals. Mm. But it sort of fits in that little area, transitional sort of, but it's commercial. Um, there, there was an acknowledgement that there are areas in town where there might be housing units upstairs, for example. Um, if there are only two or three apartments upstairs, do you want any of those to be vacation rentals? If you were building something that had eight or more units, you're, you're presumably wanting that mostly for housing. So I think if you look at the percentages, only one of them could be a vacation rental unit. Um, so it was really trying to protect housing, but also recognizing that, um, you know, say if an owner is willing to build a housing project that is, is providing moderately affordable housing, that if he can make a little extra money on one of those units, he might be more inclined to do it. So um, thinking about this in context of if there is a building downtown that's allowed to increase their height to a three-story height and they have um, housing units there, then this would apply to them. Only a certain percentage could be Right, short-term rentals. It, yes, and it depends on what the policy is that we bring back. I mean, there was a lot sure. of discussion both mm -hmm. on the public side and on the commission side, in my opinion, um, that, you know, do we want to allow them there? Do we want to just, if, you, you, if you're going to get the benefit of the extra height, you got to provide us housing. I mm -hmm. mean, certainly mm -hmm. th that is a discussion that needs to be had. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to say, yeah, we'll give it to you, but and that, that needs, be to be, needs to be housing and not, not short-term rentals. Okay. So um, mm -hmm. certainly a worthwhile discussion to be had. Mm -hmm. Now, would 
that discussion be had now, or is that more part of this subcommittee? subcommittee well, we pulled we pulled the 37 foot thing right. out, so it'll be something that happens down the road. Yeah, that's right. um, you, you mm -hmm. know, as part of that discussion about what we do down there and create mm -hmm. a yeah. design, you know, area for the downtown. And I think those discussions naturally come with it. Um, you know, or you know, do we have a different percentage for it for the 37 foot? Maybe some of it's you have to have some residential units. Period. You can't just have all vacation rental, but you can have right. some. But just to it kind of depends on you know what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve, what the, where that conversation goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? One more. Uh, when do you think the zoning code will go before the council? It's going to for. I was anticipating, so it's on the tentative agenda for the first meeting in October. Ah. Oh, so we got you, work to you do. You pushed us without pushing us. <laughs> well, you guys were doing work. I, and you okay. I, think, we're, I good. think we're ready. I think we're ready. a little that's but, you good. know, good. It could no, easily have been good. moved. All right. No, it's okay. It's, okay. <laughs> it's been a process, but I think we're there. Do we feel like we're there? I thought we had one more slide for some reason, Cindy, but I don't know. Maybe it's uh, been a long day. Uh, we yeah, had that one. Um, Chairperson Stewart's yeah. comments. I don't, yeah, and, we're done with that. And then yeah. Joe, okay. I think we had Joe, and then this, and we addressed that. And now that's up to you guys, so you guys are happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, okay, then that's it. Because I knew we had more slides. Let's do it. Okay. Well, I'd like to make. Let's do it. I'd like to make a motion that we approve PC resolution 0822 forwarding favorable recommendations to City Council for adoption of the Zoning Code Coastal Implementation Plan with finding that no further environmental review is required pursuant to state law. I can fix that. With uh, friendly amendment with the um, notations. Make yes. Good notation during our of course. Meeting. Okay. Yes. Second? I can second that. All right. Any discussion? Let's call the question. Want to do it? Okay. Come uh, on, you do it. Commissioner Rodriguez. Yes. Commissioner King. Yes. Uh, Commissioner yes. Ingrafia. Yes. Chairperson Stewart. Yes. Motion passes 4 0. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to make a comment. Um, sure. Susan, that I really appreciate Scott and Cindy's diligence. And I know that the council will hear what the Planning Commission was saying. Okay. It's now in their hands. Yeah. So that's the way the process works. But thank you very much for being very diligent about noting the Planning Commission's concerns, desires, and, and the communities as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to show up to those meetings too, yeah. Yeah. so and, and and we will definitely bring that forward in the staff report, uh, uh, loud and clear. And the reason I say that is because people will come forward and say the planning commission didn't yeah. say that, yeah, and the planning commission didn't recommend that. Well, yeah. you guys will be ready. Yeah, you guys will be ready. Well, and thanks so much to the community for their involvement and their input for uh, however many. Four, five, <sighs> six years it's been that yeah. we've been I mean, that doing this process. Really, the tracking log is, is a testament yeah. to that. Yeah. We had a, a likewise equally long one for the mm -hmm. yeah. general plan. So yep. it, 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 uh, it, it's been a long road. Yep. Staying engaged for and, the and, time. And, and yeah. made, really made better by all of the, the public input. I think so. I really do. Appreciate it. All right. Let's move on to new business. Uh, Mr. Ingrafia wants to leave town. <laughs> no. <laughs> we have to talk about it. Um, let's see, Scott, is this you? Uh, yeah, hold on just yeah. one second. Uh, I wanted to bring up the, uh, what I do with the staff report here. Somehow lost it. I know, I have it somewhere here. All right, well, I'm just going to get the hard copy out because I seem to have closed the window on my, uh, oh, no, there it is. I've got it if you want it. Okay, so, um, so Commissioner Engrafi brought to my attention that uh, he was going to take some vacation, uh, which is... And uh, in looking at the, the time frames that he, he was going to be gone from, he's potentially going to miss the October 18th and November 1st meetings. Um, and if you miss two meetings in a row, it's a, that's you withdrawing from the Planning Commission, basically, or if you miss a total of 25 in any given year. Um, the exception to that is you can get an excused absence from your brethren uh, and sister and on, the, um, on the Planning Commission. So that's why we're here. Um, Commissioner Graffi can speak for himself, so I don't need to talk for him. But... Uh, He's going to try to uh, make the uh, meeting of October 18th. He thinks yeah, that might be possible. He'll be up at like 2 o'clock in the morning or something doing that, assuming 
his technology all works. But, you know, I, just in case it doesn't work and he's not able to attend the meeting, I would like to have it covered so he has an excused absence from the Planning Commission because Joe uh, does a great job or Commissioner Graffi does a great, great job and I don't want to see him leaving the commission. I don't think he wants to leave the commission. So mm -hmm. um, that's why we're here. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add to that, uh, Commissioner Graffia? No, no, nothing. <laughs> so you're not and, trying to quit? <laughs> no. Okay. And, and, and I, I was going to ask Joe some tough questions about his desires, but and I just wanted... And bringing us all presents. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to approve in Commissioner <laughs> Graffia's uh, request to I, miss two meetings. I'd I'll like to approve. I'll start counting bribes now, yeah. <laughs> Is there a second? Joe, you can't I, I vote, will, Joe. I will second. We, okay. we can't afford to lose any commissioners. Yes, so. Any other discussion on this? No. Um, my only discussion would be that um, what happens if there's not if there's not a quorum, say on October 18th, then the meeting is canceled. Yeah, hopefully I would know that ahead of time because everybody's supposed to let myself and the chair know when they're not going to be here. So um, I would cancel the meeting, and and I don't even know that we have items for the next two meetings, so it might not it might become irrelevant. I just. You know, I, I, uh, I, as our previous city attorney used to say, uh, Joe Pannoni, belts and suspenders, um, like to have all bases covered and things like this come <laughs> up. So um, that's what I'm doing. Um, so uh, anything else? I can call the no. roll if you'd like. You can call the roll. All right, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Yes. Uh, Commissioner King. Yes. Chairperson Stewart. Yes. Motion passes 3-0. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I won't be Thank here you. on October 18th either. Uh oh. So my birthday, and I'm out of town. But, but just that one. I'm sure Commissioner Roshan will be here. Yeah, we'll all try and fill in mm -hmm. for you guys. Okay, no unfinished business listed uh, here. Unfinished business. Yeah, always have one. Uh, Commissioner Graffi, I, you know, I, I know we have a meeting on October 4th. Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, or we should have a meeting on October 4th. So we did want to bring the public benefits memo forward for final approval to move to council on the 4th. And any and all input after the 4th will go directly to council. Is that about right, Joe? In other words, we've got to send this up to council. Yeah, it, it seemed, I got responses from two of the advisory boards and, and the, the, the latter looks like October 6th that they're gonna be talking about such things. Yeah. But there really, there's no reason if they have interesting input that they could make it directly to the. Okay. Yeah. And now that you're going to be gone, Joe, for those the rest of the month, it, you know, the next two meetings after that, it, to delay it any further would be right because you'd have to be part of that process. So, so, so you, you you have input coming from a couple of the boards that you requested input from, but you want to go to planning commission with it without receiving that input. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Well. Well, I, I don't I don't know if well, um, it just struck me that it, it, it we wanted the input to go to the city council. Um, I don't know if we have to sort of pass judgment on their input. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, that was right, the idea. That, that, I mean, that, that, that's fine. I, clarity is good. Yeah. It's it's kind of a, it's up to the commission how you want to do it. I, it just for, sounded odd to me for a second yeah. there. So well, maybe, maybe it is. It, might, it actually might be odd. I don't I don't know. I mean. Um, it sounds like what you're trying to do is kind of finish this process yes. from the commissioner, yeah. the planning Cause, commission. Because our original desire. Perspective and get it yeah. forwarded to council so anything that comes after that would be up to council yeah. to deal with. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would, I would say this. I mean, you know, this commission took it up and then reached out. Um, and I don't know if you want to take that input and have some ability to synthesize it uh, at all. So, because it might. I don't know, change your recommendations to council, or I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure. I, yeah. I, 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 it, can be, it can run alongside, and then that's just the way it goes to the city council, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's the way we would convey it. Um, mm -hmm. I just, like if you saw something there, and you're like, oh yeah, I wanna, mm -hmm. we wanna change our recommendation to do that, because yeah. we didn't think about that, and. Joe, which, um, which boards was it that were willing to respond? Well, I'm, uh, I, I got a response from, uh, from the Public Works and, okay. and Eric at the Harbor, is okay. putting it up for his. So it's on his. Yeah, yeah Hab's coming up, I think, to their next meeting. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I think. No, there is, there, there is, well, I hadn't thought about that. There is a problem that the uh, the monthly meeting for the public works uh, 
board was canceled. Yeah, they got canceled. Yeah, so it got pushed out, got pushed out so one that meeting. Means but they won't until the... See, and I feel like that was part of the whole thing is that we consider things from this planning commission perspective, but mm -hmm. the Harbor Advisory Board and Public Works would certainly have a whole other point of view that was important to have and mm -hmm. capture and consider. Yeah. And, and so, and just like we do, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think that it, in, it's entirely up to the planning commission, um, but... I, I, I do think if you're making a recommendation to city council to do something, I mean, it would be good to take the input from the other boards and include that in your recommendation. And even so much as like, hey, we decided we're going to do X and Y from these boards, and we're not going to do A and C from these boards because that didn't make any se that didn't make sure. sense to us for X Y mm -hmm. reason. But we still recount it to the council because we had that input, mm -hmm. kind of like we do to you, you know, or we do mm -hmm. in our you know comment logs on the zoning code. We said hey, we didn't make these changes for X reason. Oh, this one we did make that change, and why, mm -hmm. you know, that type yeah. of thing. So so. And just for a little bit more clarification is that Joe and I agreed when we both got on this committee to serve as subcommittee members because, you know, we didn't know who would be available to do what, but we've both been working on this very hard. And our goal was to have it moved within 30 days after we first presented the memo. We are going on 120 days, guys. Yeah. You know, so there comes a point in time where, and we did put it out. We are a planning commission, our meetings are noticed. It was on the agenda. We actually went back and reached out to others. So it's not like we stopped trying to get input. We actually went out and got further input. Mm -hmm. So this process could go on forever. That's what I meant about planning never ends. All I'm saying is we'll move the best product we have up and anybody else that wants to comment on it can always comment on it. Comment on it. And in fact, I'm sure that once the council gets it, there will be comments on it. Could you request for, could you request to the Harbor Advisory Board to provide feedback by before their next meeting if they have canceled for this month? Well, I, how, how, how could they, if they don't meet, how can they provide? Well, Hab didn't, would be Hab didn't cancel, um, PWAB, Public yeah. Works Advisory Board canceled um, their meeting. Um, but yeah. this item was going to be placed on the agenda for their next meeting, so oh, they're going to talk about it. That, that, and the, the, and the, have, the have is taking that. it up at their next meeting, my understanding, from the director. Yeah, I, you know, it, 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 My inclination would be to, and I hate to do this, but to wait one more month. The, 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 the HAB's going to have, I would think, they, they roll up their sleeves and weigh in. Yeah. Um, I would imagine you're going to get stuff from PWAB, too. I just know the HAB is super interested on anything that's happening on the waterfront. Yeah. Yeah. And it's rare that they don't have a lot to say. And uh, I, mean, I think valuable input um, certainly there, and probably from PWAB as well. I, I just, I'm more familiar with the waterfront stuff in HAB just because it's down there and, and, and that type of thing. Well, and I, and I think also that perhaps citizens who pay attention to those particular boards and may not listen to us or care. I, I mean, there are those folks out, but they're going to have input too, mm. that we may not have gotten at this level because they are, you know, concerned with, say, waterfront issues. So yeah, no. I, I feel like in I'll, terms of capturing, I, sure. I just would really like to... And I'll just reach out to Joe and just say, Joe, because uh, I don't have a problem doing that, but I just wanted to make sure that people understood that we have been reaching out since we started this process. We have been reaching out. So we can continue to reach out another six months. But I would like to put a date so that maybe the November meeting when Joe returns, mm -hmm. that we can have that agendized. Yeah, if we Let's put it back on the agenda. H happy to do that. Sure. I, I don't know. I, I no no issue be, putting it on yeah. the agenda. Uh, it would just be good if we're asking other boards to sure. be in that we like yeah. consider that so, in the process. So, so yeah. Susan, I'll take that input and agree just as long as we do agendize it so when Joe returns we're ready to move it at that point in November yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. okay yeah. thank you and, and thanks for keeping our feet to the fire on right. it because it's important yeah. it I'm important. also grateful for Scott's uh, yeah thought, thoughtful advice <laughs> and and the other and, thing and is I, I I'm also thinking that um you know real it, it'll be nice to to have this report out in a, mm -hmm. a menu of of possible um additional community benefits, but it, but as an issue, it's not going to become instantly relevant. We, we still have some time before some of the projects mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. which it's focused, you know, will yeah. come. Yeah. And, and I don't know if Sean can, uh, Sean, if uh, I was thinking about Sean, I don't know if uh, Scott can comment on this, but Sean Green told me that the um, Energy Commission, the California Energy Commission had made a recommendation to provide community and public benefits to certain projects 
that it approved the California, and your, you know, Sean Green gave me that information, so that may be something that we use as well, so. I, I think what they're talking about is how the, the leases for the offshore wind are structured, and you get credit for a certain amount of public benefit um, items in there, there's a percentage. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and the question is, you know, who do those benefits accrue to? Is it to just fishermen? Is it to the communities that they're in? Is it to, um, you know, or is it just related to the labor force that's going to be working on it? It's like, so it's all of those types of things, but yeah. that's, it's, it's part of what's baked into the, uh, the offshore wind lease, yeah. uh, you know, process that's going to happen here pretty soon. And the beauty of it is by delaying, we can actually act, study that as well. So that just came up. That was just done. So, you know, we can look at our community's benefit, public benefits, as well as whoever else is going to benefit. But we obviously want that benefit if we can get it. Okay. So thank you. So that kind of combined um, future agenda items, thank you for that. Um, any other comments or proposed future agenda items? No? Community Development Director comments. I don't think I have anything else for this evening. I All right. I've talked enough. And <laughs> <laughs> you did great. Um, I, uh, oh, I will just mention um, the, the meeting we had, um, or what would you call it, workshop, um, about the master planning for the power plant area was great. There will be more. Hope people stay tuned to that and hope Commissioners can attend that. I, I thought it was really. Is it recorded and it is recorded? Online? I believe they have it. Posted it is recorded. Um, you know what I'm going to do. That actually reminds me. Thank you, Commissioner King. Um, whether we have the link posted on our planning website or not um, for the battery That'd project. So yeah, I will. Uh, I'll make sure that we have it posted there too. So yeah. uh, I'll follow up with Cindy on that. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. I think we are ready to adjourn. Our next regularly scheduled meeting will be October 4th, 2022 at 6 o'clock here at the Vets Hall. Have a good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.